Hi, welcome. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce Tanya Kovats, who is currently Professor of Drawing and Making at the DJCAD, University of Dundee. She was previously Professor of Drawing at Bath Spa University. Um, she is currently also an Associate Artist of the UNESCO Centre for Water Law, um, Policy and Science. Kovats is an artist whose work explores how culture negotiates how we connect to the natural world. Her practice embraces sculpture, drawing and writing, often, often working in the public realm. Recently, this has focused on the element of water as the connective element in the landscape. Kovats explores the psychological and poetic, as well as activating water to provide a route to explore critical environmental and socio-political questions. I'm going to hand straight over to you, Tanya. Um, so Tanya's going to deliver a 20 minute talk and then there'll be a 10 minute um, slot for question and answers afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. That's very kind. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be swimming in this wonderful conversation today. It's very, um, very exciting. Um, and I, I would just as a like first little request to whoever is out there, I can't see any audience members, but if you uh, possibly wanted to put into the chat the waters that you swim through, the waters that run through your life, um, whether that's remembered or the river you live by or the sea you live by or live with, um, it would just be very nice to bring us into a kind of watery confluence of where we all are and place ourselves through the element of water. Um, so that's a little task while I... Um, try and screen share um which did work in rehearsal um okay and go to this view um so this is my first image to share with you which is also a kind of statement which is also a question or a provocation um because i i think that we don't just walk beside rivers or swim in rivers or you know no rivers in one way or another i think they also flow through you and um this is a way of thinking that for me consolidated on a, a recent research trip to um new zealand where i was invited to be part of a, a group of um climate uh, scientists, landscape architects, um, creatives, looking at a particular area, uh, the south of the North Island that was facing um, various kind of um, environmental challenges to do with climate crisis. Um, and I was invited into a Maori community with a group of other creatives um, for a period of time living living with these people and walking and talking their land and walking and talking their environmental challenges and had access to a worldview that uh, seemed to me um, to very beautifully integrate some of our climate challenges with a kind of spiritual sense and a sense of our place on the planet in a, in a very meaningful way. And while I was in New Zealand, I also got to travel around a bit um, and went particularly to visit this river, which is the Fanganui River. Uh, again, still on the North Island. And um, so this is a view of when I first saw the river and this is the spot on the river where I was able to get into it. Um, and this is a river that uh, Maori activists for many, many years, generations actually, have been campaigning to have this river's rights inscribed in law that it is, um, has the same rights as a human, as a member of their family, as, as their ancestor. Um, and I met uh, activists that have been involved successfully in this campaign, who, have, who I would add are visited by people regularly from all around the world, who are so kind of uh, curious about what, what this means to ascribe a kind of natural feature, this water feature, with, with these sort of human rights. Um, and I certainly 
um, believe every river has its own voice, every river has its own character, um, and many of the works I've made try and kind of address that in one way or another. So th this was a conversation I, I kind of got involved with where uh, I didn't feel odd for having that belief system that myself, you know, this suddenly there was a sort of match, there was an understanding here that went, went beyond um, kind of known things and moved into a kind of metaphysical um, territory that I felt very comfortable with. So that's that's the river. This is one of the, it doesn't flow through me. I was a visitor, but it, it had a big impression on me um, and how I think about water. And these were some of the waterways that had been clogged and choked by and polluted by the dairy industry. New Zealand, we think of New Zealand as very clean, but actually the dairy industry has um, changed much of the kind of original landscape and clogged its systems. So there's a lot of work to be done. And this was the coast that was very vulnerable to storm surge, just the other side of those waterways. Um, certainly a place where you, you felt your feet on the planet. It was a very special place and I was very lucky to be there for a while. And learning kind of, um, you know, the vocabulary of a two-year-old in Maori, just trying to learn the words for water, learn the words for river, uh, and, you know, small words that mean many things, that beautifully kind of rich and layered um, uh, understanding of language. Um, I'm showing you a much older piece here because I trained as a sculptor. That's my kind of um, journey with art. Um, and even these works where I was really preoccupied with kind of geological narrative around landscape and, um, you know, how art relates to landscape and informs how we um, experience landscape. Um, you know, now I look back on this and realise even when I was making these sorts of sculptures, water was the sculptor in, in these works. You know, I was taking them from um, experiences and landscapes I'd been to in canyons or gorges that had been carved by water or cliff faces where, um, you know, coastal erosion had kind of formed these uh, landforms that I then modelled in the studio and set into these plinths. Um, that, and then the plinth went through a similar kind of geological upset as, as what was going on in the landscape. And the work very much referenced the white cube space that we kind of associate with our art experience. Um, this, was, this was quite a kind of uh, dematerializing work for me. It's called Meadow. And again, I made it quite a while ago. I, I moved a meadow from Bath to London via the inland waterway system. So in this work, I was looking at our canal systems, engineered water that is fed by river systems that were a kind of um, really important transport line of connection uh, for what that kind of moved everything around in our industrial revolution. In this case, I was moving a meadow. So I was moving a landscape through itself effectively uh, to start with, all through the uh, Vale of Pusey and, you know, there were meadows either side. The journey took about a month. It was a journey that I made in June. It was a slow journey, four miles an hour. And I wanted the work to address the question, as you move through a landscape, does it move through you? What, again, looking at this exchange, you know, does the river flow through you? Does the landscape move through you as you move through it? Um, I'm jumping quite a chunk of time on. Um, to the first work I made after making quite a kind of big, personal change in how I lived. I'd always lived in towns or cities. And then in, after a period of time traveling around South America, I came back to the UK and decided not to live in the city anymore. And I now live very rurally in um, sort of semi-derelict mill. That, so I live beside a small river. So the river is the soundtrack of my day and my night. Um, and this was the piece of work I made not long after making that move, where I, I started to think about this line of water as being the significant kind of line of connection 
um, from where I lived. You know, I live quite close to the source of this river and I, I can follow it sort of more or less to where it meets the sea. Um, this work was called Rivers and I traveled around the UK collecting water from a hundred different rivers that wouldn't normally come into confluence with each other and took water from those rivers and housed it in a boathouse that was built for the work. So you view this water collection whilst standing over water. The light in the boathouse has bounced off water. And I wanted to make moving water still. Um, you know, for me, the, I'm, I'm a very literal thinker. So the idea of the river and its relationship to time is, is very kind of apparent and obvious. Um, and with the, this work, it was almost like trying to capture a moment and make it still, like you might take a photograph. I, I stilled the water. I then went on to make a big sister to that work called All the Seas, where mobilizing a, a network of global seawater collectors, um, asking them to send me seawater from all around the world. Because what I wanted to do was bring all the world's seas to one place. And this was a work I made in, in partnership with the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh for my exhibition there. And I wanted to kind of present the water in a kind of library or quite kind of um, a lyrical or musical kind of presentation. It was never about gathering data. It was never about testing the water or understanding, you know, how much salt was in the water. Or it was, it was very much a work that began with my kind of um, relationship with the sea and became a kind of collected relationship, um, many people's thoughts and feelings about the sea. At the same time, I was collecting a body of um, drawn work, so visualizations from sailors, cartographers, explorers, um, map makers, uh, artists, engineers, uh, marine biologists, a, a whole kind of uh, looking for the sea, looking for water in our visual record and making kind of um, a narrative or a journey through looking at drawings of others and how drawings tell the story of our seas. Um, I then had a period of time uh, um, through Cape Farewell, a really pioneering organization that look at kind of culture and climate crisis and science all at once, um, to be the James Lovelock uh, artist for a year. So making um, a lot of research into sky theory, the theory that the earth itself is the largest living entity on the earth. So this kind of um, thinking of the earth as a set of systems rather than kind of different places and different things. Um, and I chose to look in particular at Gaia theory in relation to the world's seas and oceans. So um, that then made me uh, think about how we divide up our seas, how, the randomness of those acts of cartography and possession and naming. Um, so I made three very large ocean bowls in the shape of the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean in steel that I rusted with salt water. Um, and it was for a show that was at the um, Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester, which you could say is where our kind of carbon footprint began as the kind of nest or birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. But the, these are shown um, at Modern Art Oxford in a show called Future Knowledge that looked at kind of artists and designers together and responses to climate crisis. Um, as you can see, the sea continues to influence everything um, I do. Uh, this was a work I made for Hull City of Culture in collaboration with um, the aquarium there, the rather amazing aquarium called The Deep. And I wanted to make a work in response to the crisis with coral, uh, the bleaching of coral reefs. Um, so I made this kind of very large ghost reef um, out of recycled coral from one of the displays that the deep were getting rid of. So I asked if I could harvest that, bring it to the studio, make it white and represent it in these dry vitrines. Um, 
And it, so many issues uh, to do with ocean health or water health, they seem remote, they seem like a long way away. They, they can't, they're not something we can access that easily. But I was hoping through the medium of, of sort of sculpt, the sculptural object to bring people into a kind of close proximity with these amazing kind of environments that obviously very, only very few people get to see or visit. Um, and just talk about their sort of fragility. Um, I draw water, but I wouldn't say I represent it necessarily. I try and draw the kind of flicker and energy of the surface of water in a whole series of works I've made that are called sea marks. This one's on ceramic in reference to the way we tile our wet spaces, our kitchens, our bathrooms, swimming pools. Sometimes they fit walls on paper. Sometimes they're quite small scale drawings. And I've recently made um, um, hopefully a series of these drinking water fountains. This one's called Well. It was a commission from Design Exhibition Scotland. Um, this one's gone into the government art collection in Old Admiralty House. Um, and it's where you can fill up your water bottle. There's another one that will be part of the opening events for the Fruit Market Gallery uh, when that reopens in a few days. Um, so again, a very it's a small gesture to try and reduce the use of single use plastic. And um, that's the tiles laid out. Um, Rachel Carson's been a huge influence on me and I have many copies of this book, The Sea Around Us, that I draw. I draw various editions of it. I'm just about to start drawing um, editions that are in other languages. Um, other works I've done uh, have looked at other rivers. This is, this is a response to the River Thames, a commission from Tideway. So thinking about the city as a kind of ecosystem, uh, and Tideway putting in the new super sewer for London. Um, this was produced as a, a, a run of papers, as a free artwork given out to people at low tide on the autumn equinox in 2015. And it told the river's story. Um, I pointed the Thames as the editor of this newspaper. So it was in her voice. Other papers I've done haven't been like in huge kind of print runs. The Tweed was a one-off. Um, hand-drawn, hand-written, and that was presented in Berwick. So that was looking at a uh, uh, the river as a border, psychological border, geopolitical border. And I presented a set of sculptures alongside the paper called My Divers, because I'm interested in the way we kind of don wetsuits to be able to be in this other element. And the these are concrete casts uh, into wetsuits and they sort of like dive through the floor plane. Uh, there's another newspaper work currently at the London Wetland Centre produced after spending a night in the bird hide there, thinking about bird migration, wetlands globally, and the fact that the wetland centre is underneath the flight path for Heathrow. And then current, I've just stuck in a couple of current projects to finish off with. Um, I recently made this, it's a baton for Relay for Nature, uh, and it's taking part in um, a large sporting event. There. So it's the ocean race that have made a full commitment to um, a kind of environmental and ecological uh, commitment to ocean health with this major sporting event. Um, so this baton is being passed from boat to boat from various kind of government people, environmentalists, um, all sorts of people, and they're putting pledges inside of it. And hopefully it will uh, be presented at COP26 later this year. There's, they're really big on comms, the ocean race and Relay for Nature. There's loads of little videos and um, great stories about this baton's journey. So I'm very, even when I've been sort of stuck where I am, um, this baton's gone out around the world doing kind of interesting environmental things. Um, and then a recent project that's part of a show at um, Coventry, part of the City of Culture events there, curated by Invisible Dust, another organisation that puts art and scientists together. And I made this over this winter period, winter lockdown, and the river I live next to features 
quite heavily in this film. So um, I will, I, I'll put the Vimeo link in the chat. Uh, these are just a couple of stills from that. But that, uh, just to sort of show you things that I wanted to finish with things that I haven't fully processed yet, but they are kind of live and things you can access at the moment. So that was the end of the things I wanted to share with you. I think I kept to my time, but I know that was a it big that was rush. Perfect, Tanya. Your time was absolutely immaculate, really impressive, and a whistle stop tour through a series of many rich and complex works and so many links to water. Um, it's incredible the amount of kind of uh, media and um, that you encompass with your with your work and your projects and your ideas. I'm sure there's lots of questions from the audience. So, um, I mean, there's been lots of responses to your question about where people sw swim or, or swam, um, which is really lovely. That was a great kind of way to, to actually sort of get everybody engaging with, with the theme. So I don't know if you've managed to have a look through, Tanya, all the different um, uh, locations that- Gosh, there's a lot in. of this there. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm not reading, I'm just scanning the length of the list. It's like, um, yeah, it's like trying to read the map and drive the car at the same time. I couldn't look sure, at too much. But that's okay, I mean, we've got Plymouth, we've got the Thames, the Yelm, Mercy Island, Thurston. Oh, we've got Indian Ocean, Cape Town, South Africa, Burton, Bradstock, River Seven, um, Yelm, many. Oh, Macclesfield Canal. That doesn't sound very inviting, I have to say, but. You never know. Maybe it's very clean, fresh water. Um, so yeah, I mean, does anybody have any questions and would they like to ask directly rather than in the chat? Is that Eva do I see there with her hand up? Would you like to ask Tanya a question? Hello, Tanya. Thank you so much um, for such an amazing talk. I was really interested in that um, provocation, really, as you move through the landscape, does it move through you um, as you are in the canal boat um but had formulated this meadow you may hear the birds actually in the in my garden um as i'm thinking about water kind of in an inland space uh but did you find the answers you were seeking or were you surprised um that is that's a very good question um i um i think th i think i think a lot about this idea of what is the reciprocal nature of our exchanges with the non-human or beyond human or better than human <laughs> um, world? And I'm not sure it is a question that I have an answer to, but it's one that I am fairly committed to exploring, either through my own kind of experience of walking or working or swimming or whatever it is, but also through draw a drawing practice and being an educator as well and encouraging others to draw from nature, whatever nature means. It's a word that I always want to put inverted commas around. Um, but just how do we encounter things beyond, beyond us? Um, and uh, I suppose uh, in some ways my audience answered it. You know, when, when we were in the Southwest and moving a meadow through meadows uh the, my towpath audience it was a towpath audience which is a whole other kind of you know world it's not the same world as you find on the street it is a different world up by the water um you know people would know exactly what they were looking at they were like oh where are you taking that meadow where you know where are you off to and it's like the chatter that went up and down the canal before I got there people oh there's a meadow coming you know that that was always ahead of me you know it was incredible how water is a um sort of uh, line of communication. Um, but then, you know, as I got nearer to London, that all changed. In the London Canal systems, it was all like, oh, you know, you're taking the turf to Wembley. And because when the new Wembley Stadium was going in and it, you know, oh, that's a really large window box. And, you know, people saw what they knew or saw how they saw the world, you know, so it was, it was quite interesting that just, I mean, it's, again, I wasn't trying to collate this or, you know, write something about it, but it, well, it was lovely to know that 
people saw it differently. You know, to me, uh, it was what I wanted to give people was almost a dream. You know, did I really see that? Did that really happen? Did that thing really just go past me at four miles an hour at walking speed? Um, and uh, my ambition was that it would become a folk song, that it would become a kind of, uh, you know, something in memory that, that did it ever really happen? <laughs> and because that's certainly how it exists in my mind. Um, you know, I know it happened, but it, it, it was almost like a living dream for a month. You know, quite a hard work dream. I was living in the back of that barge with no electricity, no running water. You know, it was all a bit, I was pretty crusty, <laughs> dreadlocks and all the rest. But um, you know, it was absolutely wonderful as an experience. And I felt like, um, that was something you could kind of pull people into this dream. You know, meadows are really interesting uh, landscapes in themselves. You know, they're not necessarily natural. They're things we manage. They're things we depend on for feeding stock during the winter. You know, there, there's a whole kind of, um, yeah, really fantastic conversation around, well, what is a what's a meadow, you know? And, um, yeah, I suppose uh, I got caught up in a lot of different, um, ways of looking at the question, not never necessarily answering a question. I never aim to answer one of my questions. I just try and ask it better or ask it to more people or get someone else to have a go at answering it. You know, I, I, it's not, not my aim to answer a question, but it's to make, I might aim to make peace with a question, you know, feel comfortable with it but not necessarily to answer. But I don't know, how would you answer that question? Maybe you're not there anymore. I don't know, I can't see. I think it. Eva's still there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can have another question. Or have you got an answer for that, Eva? Oh, she's frozen. I think she's frozen for a minute. We might have to move on. Can I just yeah, ask- Yeah, I've, oh, I've similarly kind of- She's going. You're breaking up, Eva, unfortunately. Maybe you can uh, Sorry, on. I was similarly. Okay. Maybe you can put an answer in the chat, Eva. Because mm. I think we're losing your connection a bit. Yeah. Um, can I ask, did you feel the canal flowing through you after that very slow, long, epic journey um, taking uh, a day on the canal? <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I mean, for me, it was the, uh, the cut I, in my sculpture, what those sort of sculptures that I showed one uh, of a like landscape in a plinth. I was always obsessed with the cut, like where you end, because my experience of landscape is unbound. You know, it's why I love the sea, why I love the, my favorite place is the horizon between sky and sea, because it's like that, that's, that's what that's the kind of limit I like, you know, it's almost like thinking of the limit of our atmosphere or something like that, like really big space, unbound space. I mean, there's always a, a boundary somewhere, but, um, and uh, the thing I did get really interested in whilst traveling, various things, but was the cut edge of this engineered waterway system and how fantastic, well it all fits together and how you can go uphill how water can go uphill and how you can go up you know like the locks I mean I became quite a lock badger just sort of really interested in the gates the mechanisms that open and hold water and and then kind of walking around things like the docks in Limehouse and thinking about those massive tidal rivers like the Thames that would bring all this wealth to London and you could lock the water up and unload the ships and then release them back into the tide again. And just thinking about all of, you know, the, these gates on water were just fantastic. So there were loads of things that I did really love about it, you know, and it was like, oh, maybe I should just live on a boat now and all of that, but in the end I didn't go for that. <laughs> But it was a wonderful world. It was a one, you know, people on water are different. People with water are different. Amazing test and piece of work. There's, uh, there's one more question, or, um, or maybe there's more than one more question. Can you talk about the classification of the sea and its water? What sort of taxonomy can work and why? This is from David. Um, good question, David. I went for um, alphabet 
I arranged the list. Of, I had 92 C's that I wanted to collect. This is things that are called a C in the Times Atlas. I use the Times Atlas as a sort of source, you know, a, a kind of authoritative voice, even if I question its authority and the authority of the map and everything. But I looked through the index to find all the things called C. Um, found 92, those were my target seas. In the end, I had 365 different bodies of water. Um, so, cause people were sending me bays and channels and, uh, or I had multiple bits of the Atlantic, some of which was collected from two guys rowing across. They filled up a bottle in the middle of the Atlantic and sent it to me, or, you know, there was someone else down in the Ant Antarctica that heard about the project and sent me all these Antarctic bodies of water. And, you know, I, I didn't say no to any of the waters, but, and there were some seas I didn't get. There were a few in the Philippines that I didn't get. There were a few on the Northern coast of Russia. And this actually ended up mapping how easy is it to reach people on the northern coast of Russia? It okay. turns out I didn't have any access. The fruit market didn't have it. You know, between our collective networks, we couldn't find anyone up there that, to engage with about the project. And the Philippines were struck by a massive cyclone at that time. So, you know, you couldn't really ask someone to send you some water. So that, that's another gap in the collection. They, they're there as empty bottles. They are represented. One day. Oh, I hope we've, so. I hope we've, so. Actually, we've come to the end, but I wonder if we've got we've got four minutes break bef between sessions. I wonder if people, because I know Joanne's got her hand up. Joanne Pierce would like to ask a question. So if you're happy, Tanya, I'm happy to carry on being here until we change over at two forty. Um, so if that's okay with Sean as well. Yeah. Would you like no. to ask your question, Joanne? Yes. Um, hi. Uh, Joanne Pierce, all the way from the Indian Ocean in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I would, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I felt like you could have, you could have gone on for another four hours. Um, all of the work that you've been producing and reproducing and returning to, and also the open-endedness of some of your projects. I absolutely love that. I have a question. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the wetsuits um, that you spoke of. Um, I'm in my research. I'm working with porosity of bodies and um, and thinking about water. And in South Africa, wetsuits are they are in many ways material exclusions for some bodies, and and um, um, they afford access for other bodies, especially in the legacy of South Africa of race and spatial um, exclusion. So. I know you touched on that, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that project, um, those molds and those costs that you, you refer to. Um, well, I, I, I very much understand your comment about, um, you know, not everyone has a wetsuit, everyone has a skin. And skins can tolerate a certain amount of time in the water, but that depends on water temperature and, you know, how, how you, what your relationship is with getting in the water. Wetsuits can prolong that time um, and insulate you from the experience as well. I don't actually really like wearing a wetsuit. It's just I can't swim in cold water in the way I used to be able to. I can swim, but then I'm cold for like a week afterwards or something like that. Um, but that's not necessarily the relevant information. Um, I, 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 this may be a myth you're familiar with, the silky myth which is a kind of mermaid sea creature. It's, it's a sort of Scottish and further north myth uh, who um, can slip off her skin but in order to come onto the land. And she comes onto the land to dance because she loves to dance and, and feel that experience to be naked on the beach. Um, and, but if someone uh, sees her and takes her skin, she belongs to them. It's, it's a very uh, complex myth because then she will uh, be sort of enslaved to this man and she will have his children and she'll, she'll give birth to children with webbed hands. And if she ever finds her skin, no matter how content she is, she will um, 
take that skin, put it back on and, and go back to the water. She won't be able to stop that compulsion. And I, I think it's a, I think that's, there's something in that with the wetsuit and not, uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's a very high tech version of a silky skin. Um, but we all shed our skins at different times, so our relationship with ourself, uh, you know, I think we're very layered as, as it, um, uh, our experience of the self is a very layered one. So there are layers we can take off. And the wetsuit for me sort of represents that. And that we have this liquid self, which is sort of at the center, but it needs a containment. It needs the skin to hold it together. But so, there are times in water where our liquid self is free to, you know, the oceanic, it just becomes part of this bigger world. And it's, it's hard to achieve that, you know, we're not really designed to be in water for very long or very comfortably. And, you know, there are all sorts of things that make swimming hard and being in water hard. But there are also these oceanic moments where our liquid self is free to be in this state of exchange with water. And for me, the, the wetsuit kind of, because working with a material that is liquid, you know, it's slushy mush and very heavy and you know, absolutely fills the wetsuit to bulging and makes these like really quite kind of enormous body shapes, you know, obese is the right kind of word. Um, and then they turn to stone or stone-like. And then I have this other experience in the studio, which is trying to get the wetsuit off, which takes a couple of days because it, it's this kind of act of ripping and tearing and peeling uh, that this kind of, re what remains, this kind of, uh, of this ecstatic uh, moment in the water of kind of diving down and being one with the water that the wetsuit's allowed, but you have to peel that skin off. Tanya, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to rudely interrupt you there. I know you're just I'm, talking. I'm going to to There's I'm so much to talk there. about. <laughs> I need to pass over to Sean, who's going to chair the next panel. But please carry on chatting, everybody, in the chat and exchange um, ideas. And yeah, that's that's wonderful. And thank you again, Tanya, for a wonderful Welcome. talk. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Lovely. Bye all. Thank you, Tanya, so much. That was really interesting. Um, yeah, uh, to follow Rachel, I'd encourage everyone to keep adding questions to the chat, including for this next panel that I'm about to introduce now. Um, so I'm Sean Goulson. I'm a PhD researcher at Plymouth, um, as are our three participants on this panel. Um, I'll keep this very short. All three presentations are very personal. So we've gone from this very broad um, global consideration to very personal speakers, each of whom are referencing their own lives and their experiences as they connect with specific times, places and relations between the material and immaterial bodies of or and water. Um, so with no delay, I will hand over to our first speaker, Gail Flockhart. Thanks, Gail. Thank you, Sean. Can you hear me OK? We can hear you. Good, OK. Um, yes, yeah, so well, thanks very much for that. Uh, Mary is actually going to play my presentation because um, my internet is very unreliable. So uh, Mary will share her screen and play my recorded uh, presentation, if that's okay. Hi, I'm Gail and I'm researching for a PhD in art and media, exploring post-human approaches to rethinking trauma in women's art. Today, I'm relating the account of my research methodology and one strand of practice contributing to my project. I often find myself wandering off, drawn to the deep end I wade in, straying beyond the shallows. Then, on tiptoes, up to my neck in water, I just want to see if a little further on there is something more to see to make sense of it all. Then whoosh. My feet lose contact with the ground. I'm out of my depth, overwhelmed and overcome. I can't cope. The surface is above me now, moving further away. I'll never make it back. I'm dragged under. I cannot breathe. I panic. I feel myself breathing liquid. I'm drowning. I crave the gills. This anxiety dream comes in various forms. Sometimes I'm in a car as it plunges into water. 
The horizon creeps up the windscreen. I can't open the doors or windows. I am trapped. So how do our painful memories or traumas speak to us or to others? How does the trauma of others speak to us? Trauma may be experienced for many reasons. Early childhood disruption, neglect, abuse, violence, a personal tragedy or living through war. Individually or collectively, trauma and post-traumatic fallout is difficult to articulate. In unclaimed experience, Kathy Carruth evokes something of the challenges involved in dealing with the language of the wound and our ability to understand it. Carruth writes, Sometimes a traumatic address comes from our past. Sometimes it comes from pasts we do not know. Sometimes it is ours and sometimes the voice of another. Sometimes we speak with a voice that precedes us, a voice that is not ours but whose only opening is through the language that cries out from our wounds. This affiliates with Margaret Iverson's critique of artists' work in photography, trace and trauma. Considering the unrepresentable nature of trauma, Iverson notes, how could something so elusive be the subject of a work of art? The art of trauma, because it aims to represent in some fragmentary way something that eludes our grasp, often verges on the indecipherable. In this paper, I use metaphor and methodology to explore post-human epistemologies for rethinking trauma. Reviewing my encounters with water, alongside found objects and an archive of water-damaged family photographs, I consider how watermarks can provide a powerful and multi-layered metaphor for rethinking traumatic inscription. In these images of my late mum's ironing press cover, the marks can be read as cartographies of time and event. Repeated exposure to the action and agency of water through sting and heat has left its imprint on the artefact. The marks penetrate the surface and leave a trace on the underside. The history, setting and location of the press beside the stair lift on the landing constitute an assemblage of entities and moments. For me, cartographic inscriptions left on Mum's ironing press have burned a history of memories into the last territorial map of her active engagement with life. Using a diffractive methodology for the creative knowledge-making process has moved me from an individualist perspective towards post-human notions of an embedded, embodied, relational and effectively entangled subject. To clarify in science, diffraction occurs when waves encounter an obstruction or opening. Interference or diffraction patterns can thus be produced by dropping pebbles into a pond when concentric rings pulse out and intersect each other on the water's surface. Expanding this within a post-human feminist framework, Donna Haraway proposes diffraction as a strategy for reading one phenomenon, artefact or text, through another. Haraway's proposition is radical and discursive. Quote, what we need is to diffract the rays of technoscience so that we get more promising patterns on the recording films of our lives and bodies. Developing this in Meeting the Universe Halfway, physicist and feminist philosopher Karen Barad explains, quote, a diffractive methodology is a critical practice for making a difference in the world. Understanding which differences matter, how they matter and to whom. Therefore, it is not about analysing static entities, but phenomena in their material configurations of becoming. So focusing on what Barad proposes as a post-humanist performative approach, my emphasis shifts from reflective correspondence and representationalism towards creative processes of mattering. Consolidating these theories, Rosie Bredotti appeals for imaginative critical practices in the humanities to visualise the subject as a transversal entity through an ethics of affirmative enactment. Bredotti writes, We need to devise a new vocabulary with new figurations to refer to the elements of our post-human embodied and embedded subjectivity. Using a performative approach in these experiments, I capture individual drops of inky water at 400 frames per second. This allows me to see and attend to what practices, doings and actions matter. Releasing a drop of inky water from a pipette into water 
I notice how the surface tension seems to deflect the drop, which bounces on the surface, drawing back up as an elongated globule. It then splits, multiplies and falls as droplets that scatter. As tiny beads, they tremble across the surface until they imperceptibly melt back into the water. This clip experiments with drops of milk. The causes and effects of my performative actions might be interrogated to better understand how trauma, trace and memory split, disperse and fragment the self. However, Barad proposes, quote, intra-actions enact agental cuts, which do not produce absolute separations, but rather cut together apart one move. There is no moving beyond, no leaving the old behind, no absolute boundary between here now and there then. Even the smallest cuts matter. Diffractively thinking trauma through water places these photographs within a framework intersecting playful practices, doings and actions with a detailed scrutiny of their water-damaged surfaces. Inspired by artists such as Joe Spence and Rosie Martin, whose subjectively situated work similarly delves into family histories and photographic archives, I consider how the material and pigments blister, bleed, crystallise and encrust in these relics of time in times past. The images have become more abstract, distorted, displaced, disconnected. This clip of a damaged family photograph stuck to the embossed wallpaper of an imagined interior is almost submerged. The visible is reflected onto the underside of the water's surface. The corner is still above the waterline, screened by the strength of the interior reflection. The viewer is visually returned in a perpetual iteration of trying to see through the surface to what is above. Further, while the artefact deteriorates, its semiotic imprint is always untouchable. As with trauma, the virtual mental motif replays in a continuous loop on the underbelly of our watery perceptions. A diffractive approach thus provides an escape from the optical metaphor of infinite reflection, opening the critical space to considerations of complex intersecting patterns of differentiation. This creates opportunities for new material and semiotic figurations of the self to emerge in an affirmative way. Relating the function of consciousness in trauma to Freud's mystic writing pad, Margaret Iverson relates this as, quote, a protective shield against excessive stimuli figured as the clear plastic cover of consciousness, which does not retain traces. However, where Freud's cover repels inscription, mine holds onto them in his right. Events and places shift from one skin to another. The opaque membranes of memory are unable to show the full picture or tell the whole story. In this final clip, I experiment with repetition and multiple perspectives to find a language that speaks of trauma's multi-layered, nebulous and unrepresentable nature. In summary, considering how we might listen to the address made by trauma in a language we cannot fully grasp, and how, as practitioner researchers, we might better understand these issues, I return to Cathy Carruth, who suggests a fresh approach to hearing trauma as a call by the other. Carruth proposes an understanding which constitutes, quote, a new mode of reading and of listening that both the language of trauma and the silence of its mute repetition of suffering profoundly and imperatively demand. Braidotti also encourages us to devise a new vocabulary and figurations fit for today's posthuman subjects. So we can act posthumanly, that is, from an embodied, embedded, and relational space. We can act diffractively, creatively, and materially to address the challenges wrought by trauma and its mental health implications. As Cathy Carruth affirms, the theory of trauma addresses us ultimately with the possibility of life, but in a voice we cannot always identify, and in a language, enigmatic and resonant, that we must still learn to hear.
This project has prompted a reappraisal of painful personal narratives towards new pathways for articulating the ripple out after effects of trauma. As I strive to find a visual language articulating the ways trauma and post-traumatic memory manifest, I hope to unearth the diffractive lines of embodied thought that might discern the smallest cuts or traces inscribed in the ebb and flow of our lived experiences. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gail, and apologies to those for whom the sound um, was tricky. Um, I could hear it here, but I know if a lot of you have commented to say that you couldn't. Um, I don't know whether Gail will be able to share anything with you, but um, I will leave questions till the end because obviously we're short on time and move straight on to Linda. Hi there. Just to say, um, I put in the chat right at the very top two films that I will be referring to in a bit, which you could look at later if you so wish. This uh, shot behind me is from the rushes of a film I made a couple of years ago called Mary River. The theme of Mary has been a constant iconic totem in my work, deriving from a statue in a church in Marbella that I particularly associate with my mother and with a time with her in Spain. My talk is called River, Sea, Ocean, Mum and Me, and I shall start with a stream of ideas I've been working on as an introduction. River. I lived at Riverside House, the house and garden falling into the yelm, sailing dreams of children and waking to water. A friend floated Ophelia-like to where the sweet waters meet salt. When you do performance, you find your place, and I will find a place in the water. Yes, in the water, she said. Sea. My mother's house led down to the sea, a flat yard of vines and mushrooms into Mersey Island Sea. My mother took pictures, me in a red bikini. We talk at the shoreline and shiver. Tea tastes best at the sea. Ocean. My son has swum all of his life with me, crossing the elm, filling our red plastic buckets to make sandcastle moats, capturing changing waters with cameras strapped to our bodies, the flicker and movement of waves, the connection that comes from looking out to blue, placing myself in the water, placing pearls in the water, to see them shine. Mum, with me yet gone, the love crossing time, space and memory, a calm after a terrifying storm. I wish for a storm to test my strength against. I cried for the gale force wind, for electric explosions, for sheets of rain. I wished to be battered and to emerge triumphant wrote Margaret Tate. Me, I cry in water. I release and feel refreshed. I dive for pearls in order to sail home. Standing in the water to make the film Mary River, I follow the currents with my camera, enjoying the downward movement downstream, at times finding the pleats, the crests and the clots of the water. There is more to diffraction than meets the eye, writes Karen Barad, in meeting the universe halfway. She tells us that it is more subtle than classical understanding suggests. And while I'm part of an interactive, ongoing articulation of the world in its differential mattering in the water, with the water, I am also in a moment of being. In an essay from 1919, Modern Novels, Virginia Woolf writes, let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind in the order in which they fall. Let us trace the pattern, however disconnected and incoherent in appearance, with each sight or incident scores upon the consciousness. Marina Warner notes that Marguerite derives from the Greek meaning pearl. My mother's name is Margaret and I place the pearls she left me in the water. While making Mary River, I was influenced by Henri Bortoff's explanation of phenomenology. He writes, I stood on a bridge 
looking downstream at the river flowing away from me. For some reason, this made me feel uneasy and I crossed to the other side to look at the river flowing towards me. And this felt better. And I spent some time there looking upstream. I began to be drawn into the experience of looking, plunging with my eyes into the water flowing towards me. When I closed my eyes, I sensed the river streaming through me. And when I opened them again, I found that I was experiencing the river flowing towards me outwardly and through me inwardly at the same time. Icons are mysterious working objects, according to Marina Warner. Perhaps films might be. I've made a film considering climate change and joined many artists at the High Tide event earlier this year to highlight rising sea levels and to imagine the sea differently. The film Sea Hydrangea offers a blue mist of, of hydrangea, the water flower, insinuating time fading in a rising ocean. The film has a muted palette and transpositions. The plant is capable of color change when it interacts with a chemical element. It was one of the many flowers in my late mother's garden. The word hydra has a Greek root meaning water. The notion of immersion of life in the sea becoming death or the threat of death also pertains to a personal experience of a boat trip with my mother off the coast of Spain when a tropical storm hit and a giant wave emerged from the horizon threatening to swallow the boat. I found I froze and was unable to function but was saved by my mother who quickly and expertly fitted me with a life jacket as we had to swim to shore. My own experience of the storm at sea and the strength and resilience of my mother has been a lasting inspiration in my work. The conflation of my mother with Mary, as I stated at the beginning, goes back to the statue in the church my mother frequented in Marbella. The experience on the boat reinforces the notion of protector, a common hope associated with Mary, especially in the form of Stella Maris. Warner notes, Painters stressed Mary's emergence as a guiding light to mariners by placing a star on her shoulder in altarpieces of the Middle Ages. The statue of Mary in Plymouth, standing sentinel overlooking Firestone Bay, has been a point of focus in my work prior to lockdown. As access was restricted, my work has taken ideas of the association between Mary and the sea into different directions. In the film, a pinch of blue. I developed an embodied filming strategy, placing the camera on my lips and using my head as a gimbal to tilt down. A pinch of blue was an award winner at the Dubois International Film Festival, and the viewer may be put into a contemplative mode by its slow reveal. The oral content perhaps offers a state of yearning, maybe a coexistence of suffering and release. To me, the tree that you're about to see swathed in blue stands in for the Mary statue around the bay of Firestone that in turn stands in for the Mary statue in Marbella that stands in for my late mother in a sense that it offers me a physical reference of a maternal persistence in spirit.
Thank you, Linda. Um, as we're still running a few minutes behind, I will very uh, quickly um, introduce my colleague, Laurie, who will speak about their work next. Over to you, Laurie. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, oops, let's play this. Um, so I just want to talk about a project that I undertook for the box in Plymouth um, to explore and celebrate the LGBTQIA plus community. My project, Unsubstantial Territory, was influenced by a rereading of Virginia Woolf's The Waves. During this read, I identified traits and situations that Woolf's characters exhibit through their struggle to define themselves that I had found in myself. Within Woolf's experimental novel, the characters may not be separate characters at all, but that are facets of a larger personal construct, as are the different code switches I, in fact, navigate were all part of my queer identity and experience. Unsubstantial territory consists of a series of photographs crafted with analog methods using English waters channels as a collaborator within the process. Compiled into a zine alongside interviews with fellow members of the LGBTQIA community on their experience in code switching. I'd like to share with you my personal context and the backstories of this project. I am a non-binary queer person, but I wasn't born that way. For like most people, my gender was assigned at birth. The doctor looked at my genitals and proclaimed that I was a boy, a decision that would dictate for years what colors I wore, what toys I got for Christmas, and what interests I would have, and an unrealistic comprehension of the understanding of what the offside rule is. I still have no idea. But this isn't my sole dis um, reason for having distrust in doctors. I think I inherited some of that from my mum, who was terrified of hospitals and doctors, so much that she refused to be taken hospital and I was a home birth on the same bed they own today, a point that my dad likes to make um, at any opportunity I visit. So from this moment, I was brought up like a sort of boy, but I don't have really many memories of this time. For when I was roughly about 12, I contracted encephalitis, an inflammation of my brain, which after spending a long time in hospital, I had to relearn a few things. I had basic communication down, and after some physical therapy, I could walk and interact with other people, but I had no sense of who I was. I think my parents wanted to butch me up and nurture me into the man I was destined to be. But like other millennials, my true parental upbringing was pop culture, in particular Star Wars. I collected the toys, I obsessed over Princess Leia's outfits, and often during playtime, the Luke Skywalker and Han Solo action figures would take long trips away to Brighton in the Millennium Falcon. My parents decided to help me in the only way that parents can, by enrolling me in various masculine activities, one of which was rugby which is a great sport to put your kid into if you think kitting your child is wrong, but you feel like someone should be doing it. Although it did have a number of opposite effects that my parents intended. Firstly was the tuck shop in the clubhouse after each game, rewarding physical activity with sugar. Now the years have gone and this has transformed into any activity. Whenever I start to read a really large book, I place party rings throughout the chapters as a reward. I now don't measure a book in pages, but in calories. When I first finished Thousand Plateaus, for instance, I put on half a stone. I learned that making jakes was a good way for people to laugh with you and not at you. But the biggest effect was the locker room. It was the first time I saw another naked human body and I realized I was different. Not only did I feel an attraction to males, but I started to realize that it wasn't the norm. I was different. And suddenly the years of wearing restrictive jeans, playing bamboo sticks, pretending they're lightsabers made sense. I was being trained, learning that my perceived gender and sexuality was a performance. And I got good. From the outside, I looked and act and behaved and performed masculinity. It became second nature. I almost convinced myself, but I couldn't deny my physical attraction to male presenting bodies. I came out. I remember telling my mum, we both sat on the same bed I was born on. And after building enough courage to tell her, I couldn't help but think, this is now the second time I've come out on this bed. As my life couldn't be more intertwined with Star Wars, her reply to this news was, I know. And for a time, I began performing my new role, that of a gay white cis man. It's a more nuanced performance than before. I had to navigate spaces with intrepidation, change my behavior, the way I dressed, talked, out of fear of being ridiculed or worse, physically hurt. I started to learn pride in myself and accept my gender isn't what I present to the world, but that was something different. I code switch. 
For all of us, code switching is a normal part of engaging with different social situations, such as the difference between how we act in formal and informal situations. If you've ever worked in retail, you probably know how to code switch. You might call it your customer service voice. For members of a minority community, it has different stakes. Code switching has become a normality for most LGBTQIA plus members developed to simply be. To truly be ourselves is not a privilege given to us, as our queerness isn't accepted in spaces that are critical for success and survival and is dominated by heteronormality. We are bodies of water arranged slightly differently. It reminds me of a comment I once came across while surfing the Star Wars fanfic Reddit. The human body is 80% water, so we're basically cucumbers with anxiety. I code switch often through my day-to-day -day life, like the water in me crashing over like the waves on the shore, wiping over the marks made in the sand. I become a new personality. We have placed so much importance into our bodies, their differences and the roles they're meant to play. This has affected us, etched into our psyche and has become as part of us. As Lauren Howe puts it, it's the difference in how we see our bodies. For men, their body is itself a defense. For women, our bodies are what we're trying to defend. Having walked in the literal shoes of a straight white cis man, I'm size 12, so the only thing that available to me at the time, budget and size was either knockoff branded Kappa Kate skater shoes with silhouette of two naked women or massive boring bound brogues with extremely pointed toes, which just accentuated my large clown feet. I've learned some things through the years of performance, some things that straight white people have taken for granted, our privilege. Art has allowed me to think more about my gender, dismantle my layers of privilege. I still benefit from that privilege. From a quick glance, I still, I present as male. And with that, things I do, I take for granted. For instance, I can take public transport and I don't have to be worried about being groped or sexually assaulted. I can read a book in a, in a bar or a cafe without being disturbed. And I can walk at home at night with relative safety. I'm very aware of how I appear. I look like a six foot man, which can be very intimidating, especially at night. I remember walking home one night from a night out pre-COVID. I had a few. I lived on the other side of London from my friends. I remember getting on the night bus and there were a few other people on there. And to be honest, I didn't even consider any of them. I was fighting the huge urge not to fall asleep in the warm stickiness of the seats, only to wake up in a bus depot in Surrey. True story. Did you know there are tons of buses at the depot, but only a single bus stop isn't a mile away, a mistake you only have to make once. When it came to my stop, I got off, as well as another passenger. I didn't realize it at the time, but she was a woman walking slightly ahead of me. We were walking in the same direction. It then struck me, I started to notice the subtle roots of fear in her footsteps, the slight quickening of her pace, the tightening grip around her handbag. I noticed this too, because I felt like this, not safe. Something I had taken for granted. What was a simple walk home after an evening in the pub was something completely different. To her, she could be in potential harm. I couldn't take a turn, there wasn't a turning off the road. I could turn around, but it was cold and I wanted to get home. In that moment, I code switched. I needed to perform once again, but this time, in, instead of reducing my queerness, I exaggerated. I walked faster in what can only be described as a pronounced mince. I wanted to signal my queerness and let the women know I wouldn't harm them. I often think about this encounter. Was I effective in my communication? Was she okay? I now carry one article of rainbow colored apparel or something else gay whenever I go out for a few drinks. But I also think, what if it wasn't me? Just some other straight white cis guy. Would they even know that merely their presence could cause harm? Cause harm? Does this hypothetical man know that she might not feel safe going out to dark anymore? Or that she might even stop going out to see friends? Or uh, simply just work late or stop living her life on her own terms? It would help if men who look an awful lot like me, straight, white, cis men, would learn something from code switching just a little bit change their behavior in situations and environments that they haven't had to before. Be more considerate beyond yourself and realize your privilege and see and support that vulnerable person. And then maybe one day we could be a little bit less afraid of one another, be safer 
and live our authentic lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, they were three really moving and powerful presentations and very effective as well. Um, so once Laurie starts sharing, I wonder if anyone's got any questions that they would like to ask to any of the panel. Harriet, I can see your hands up. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for three really fascinating um, presentations there. My question is for um, Gail. Is that yeah, Gail? Um, so regarding trauma theory, um, and just so so that I'm not sort of blindsiding you, I'm asking you this as a trauma theorist myself. I noticed that you use Freud, you use Carruth, um, good stuff, and I wonder the mention of the idea of unrep uh, unrepresentability, gosh, there's a word, um, which sort of haunts Freud and haunts Carruth and all of their ideological children. We're putting it to one side in a lot of contemporary trauma theory and people like Balayev and Schwartz and uh, sorry, Schwab and Bennett aren't talking in terms of the unrepresentable. And I wonder if you could sort of respond to that. What, what do you think of, of the breaking down of that idea in relation to trauma? Of course, that's quite a heavy duty question, really. I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think I've looked at uh, Bessel van der Kolk um, in terms of trauma, and Kathy Carruth reads trauma through a, a literary uh, analysis. So I think in my using uh, Kathy Carruth, it was basically to try and um, uh, make a parallel, you know, way of reading trauma through another layer. So I'm introducing uh, Carruth's idea as a way of, um, well, she was reading trauma through, through various different literary uh, examples. Um, I, I, I've not read hugely on Freud, um, but the mystic writing pad was very interesting to me uh, because the plastic cover of the mystic writing pad kind of like spoke to me about the trying to make the inscriptions and them not actually appearing on the protective cover. Whereas on my damaged photographs, the pigments had kind of gone from one from the original onto the cover. So it was kind of a, an analogy to that. Um, I don't know if that helps or if I haven't really answered you. No, that's, that's really interesting. Um, would it be okay if I sent you a couple of things that I'm suggesting? Yes, <laughs> yes. That sounds certainly. really, really sort of, you need to read these, but they, they might be helpful. No, that's excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm muted, sorry. Thanks, Harriet. Thanks, Gail. Um, does anyone else have any questions for any of our panel? Yeah, Rachel. Can I ask? Um, can I ask Laurie about the imagery that you used for your very poignant, powerful um, talk? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. What was the question? Sorry. I, I just wanted to know more about the imagery that you um, that you worked with um, whilst you were talking and kind of very openly talking about yourself and your life and your experience. I know you made this sort of riser appearance as part of your commission for the box, but I wondered what the con kind of content of the imagery, imagery was and was it kind of taken from sort of analog? Because I know you work with a lot of really interesting photographic cameraless and camera sort of processes. And I just wondered where they kind of, where they originated from, where they came from as a series. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, so each photograph was based on a character in Virginia Woolf's novel um, and just exploring how they kind of interact and view the world, um, such as Rhonda's um, need for family and the roots because she feels so removed from what connects her to her community. Um, and each image was then constructed from that. Um, I'm completely, I've, um, I did, yeah, all the, the, the film processing was used using seaweed as a developer and then salt water from the English channel to develop it because it felt important to, to use the kind of the metaphor of the waves flashing over me as the actual main driving point for the images as well. 
Um, and it just it felt like it all connected. Um, and then for the actual the actual risograph, um, I wanted the actual zine you can download, but you can physically get it in the box if you just uh, if you turn up. Um, and I wanted it to keep it back to that subculture of underground queerness where you couldn't go through major publications to talk about these things. It's very much a DIY aesthetic to kind of communicate. And I kind of wanted to keep that tradition alive, really. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. I'd really love to pick your brains about which seaweeds you used, but I'll, I'll ask you another time. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I think we've come to the end of our time on this panel. I don't know, Mary, if you can confirm. I think it was 20 past three. It, it was, but if there's another burning question, I'm sure that it wouldn't hurt to, to, answer, to ask it. I mean, I've got quite a lot of questions, but I'd like to offer the, the audience a chance to ask anything that they want to. Go on, Sean, ask your question. Okay, um, well, it's kind of, it's a twofold thing. Uh, one, I really, I thought the three papers together were very interesting for the different types of performance they evoke and the different kinds of performance that were happening in practice, in real life. And they all connected with this kind of sense of, of, of being something or an affective. And I just, I just wondered then, with all of them reflecting on, on a lot of memory and past experiences, what those performances and those, those practices help each of the participants or what kind of spaces they make or things they do um, in practice. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And um, perhaps I might just answer first of all, just to say that um, when I film um, my camera, I sort of, with my camera, I sort of think about, um, I'm influenced quite a lot recently by Maya Deren and her idea of the choreography and that connection between the camera motion and body movement. So I'll, I'll approach um, a subject when I'm filming it and that um, close looking will come um, in a very sort of um, organic way, but literally using my body as a piece of apparatus and extension um, of uh, the camera perhaps. And that's, that's how I try to get as close as I can to the surface of the water. So I'm sort of skimming it if I'm using um, a sort of a, an iPhone maybe. Um, and I, I just try to, um, be with the subject as closely as I can. So that's the performative aspect of my filmmaking. I don't know how it is for you, Gail, or is... um, well, Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I, th me, I think I've kind of, something that I kind of realised quite early on is there was, especially to do with my own identity, there was quite a lot of shame um, to do with um, being LGBT. Um, and quite a lot of time I would separate everything apart from mentalize kind of my life. And in my research practice, I struggle with the human aspect of centering myself. Um, and I kind of really wanted to dive into a project where I could not only reconnect with my community, but also then just explore who I am as a person. Um, and it, it just, it, for me it was invaluable for that and what I learned is that even though the experience of code switching within minorities community is quite prevalent it's quite controversial and people have different aspects to it so it for me I kind of wanted just to bring the conversation aware to a community that might never know it so if it, it, yeah I don't know if that answered it at all I'm really sorry <laughs> what do you think Gail I'll pass it back to you Yeah, I think on the performative uh, element, um, my early work was very much to do with self-representation and looking at the self and ways of looking at the self in quite a, a literal way, putting myself in front of the camera. And my relationship between the media and, and the output, if the media was very integrated, um, but I've moved from looking at myself as a person to actually looking at the way I look at things. So the performative actions are very much um, being analyzed in that's in a subjective way. So also 
moving from the reflective to the diffractive I'm trying to sort of break through that um, mirroring where you're between two mirrors and you're just infinitely bouncing backwards and forwards um, so I'm kind of embodied in all of the making and the visuals are informing the performance of the making and it sort of iterates through like that. Thank you. I don't think I asked the question very well, um, <laughs> but your answers actually all kind of drew on on what I was thinking about, which was that through all this performance, you're enabling this kind of movement forward from something into something else. Um, so, yeah, I guess we should draw to a close now so that we can move on with proceedings. But yeah, thank you very much to Gail, Linda and Laurie. So it's me again. Hey, uh, um, so I'd just like to introduce the next uh, section of our talk. Um, so um, during the genesis of Watermarks, we realised a need for the restorative value of nature and wished to refigure our post-human politics of locations through the wet hydrocomics of wet relations. Our next speaker undoubted, undoubtedly contributes to that discourse. Their practice and research explores the entwined and intricate relationship between the human and the non-human through painting and the contemporary landscape. They are an artist and senior research fellow at the Slade School of Fine Art, who has recently shown at the Helsinki Contemporary Finland, Newman Gallery in Cornwall and the Flat Time House in Peckham, London, with upcoming shows at Room 2 at Krast at Schubert, London and the Nortelia Museum in Sweden. Within this talk, she'll focus on the recent development of new paint made from recycled polluted waste residues as water passes through the abandoned mines. It considers the social, economical and ecological imprint carried by the mine water of past human extractive practices occurring in a particular place in the world at a particular time in history. So it's with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Anya McCorson. Hi, Laurie, and thank you so much for the invitation uh, to talk. And um, and I just would like to comment on your uh, your talk and how um, enjoyable it, it, it was and important it is the, the, the work that you're doing and the way that you're communicating it. I think it's fantastic. And so a real privilege to have been witness to that. Um, I'm going to do a slightly peculiar thing, which is um, run two computers at the same time, which isn't particularly sustainable way of approaching my sustainable approach to art making, but I wanted to in, kind of introduce you to the site that I'm going to be talking about in a sort of audible way, as well as slightly vis visible. So give me a second, I'm going to open up, uh, first of all, I'll open up the, um, the images that I'm going to share are on the screen with you. First things first. So I think this is the power, a little PowerPoint thing. Have, can you see that? Uh, yeah, we can see that. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we're going to play it. So it should. Okay. So have you got that nice on on the screen? Yeah. Okay. And now I'm just going to set up something else. We'll be back in a second. Now, I'm hoping you'll be able to hear an audio. Can you hear the audio? I don't not, think not we can only hear you speaking. Just I'm me really speaking. Okay, it's not working. One second. Okay, well, it was worth a try. Um, <laughs> I wanted to take you for a sort of walk around uh, around the site that I'm talking going to be talking about, um, but no matter. Um, we'll go through this visually rather than aud audibly. 
Um, <clears throat> The, the 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 name of the talk is is the site location the 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 um the satellite reference reference number of the site location and the name of the site itself so it's kind of um uh, talking about uh how this particular project sort of manifested and, and i'll talk a little bit about some of the um some of the uh processes that i've gone through um can you see the is the is this is the uh, image full screen to you? Was it just? Uh, it's not. Are you okay to press play? Yeah. Okay. Will. So is that Perfect. good? Yeah. That's oh, good. Right. Thank you. Good. 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 Okay. Um, so I guess yeah, I'm going to be talking about my relationship between between water and color and how this is manifested as um, making paint and the particular kind of cultural influences that overlap with these materials. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat um, at some point, uh, which is a link to a website, which is where the kind of um, this research kind of sort of the confluence of this research sits. I'll probably do that at the end, actually. Um, um, Okay, well, Six Bells and, and, and the, the, the place is Six Bells in Blanau, Gwent, um, South Wales. Um, right, now I'm just going to try and organize, organize the screen a little bit. Um, sorry, because I don't want that there. And I'll put the link in the chat quickly so you can see it. I think this is kind of useful because um because if you want you can um actually connect with it so uh as i'm talking so i'm going to do this now okay so if you want to just uh look at the look at the website then the content is on there Um, Six Bells sits by the um, Ebwefak River, surrounded by hills that spread out on either side of the steep valley. Um, the west side is covered with trees and the east side is slightly tilted towards the south and a bit more built up, gradually thinning out. Um, uh, towards the tree, tree line up the hill. So further to the north, the houses merge with the larger town of Abitaleri. Um, and the, bar, the banks of the river Edwire back are thick, thickly, now thickly covered with beech, hazel, birch, sycamore, hawthorn, and oak. And further up the hillside, um, dark green conifers, Scots pine, and Douglas fir. So it's a really green, luscious landscape. And the mine water treatment site is incredibly peaceful. The main road is about 20 meters to the west and the sound of cars are drowned out by the sound of water cascading down the mine water aeration system. It's surrounded by a high green mesh fence and the peacefulness is contained by this, uh, close to the water's edge, there's rushes and grasses and wild iris are growing. And um, yeah, contractor comes and cuts and keeps the whole place neat and tidy. Um, and these reed beds and lagoons are cleaned out every uh, five years or so. So when the mines were dug, the coal mines in South Wales, they dug beneath, descended below the water table the flood water that was, was underground had to be pumped out for the mines to be worked. And when the pits closed, the pump stopped and the mines filled up again. So this water that began to emerge at the surface, carrying dissolved pyrite salts, released and picked up in the water from that exposed geology. Um, Six Bells Colliery closed in 1987, and five years later, the Ebwefak uh, River turned 
this bright orange colour. These minerals oxidise on contact with the air, forming particles of iron. Um, water will flow endlessly through these mines. The water levels will rise and flow uh, and where, as weather conditions and climatic variations change. But the waters will keep flushing through the miles of work, workings, picking up minerals uh, along the way. These mine water treatment sites have to be built to divert and treat this water, which otherwise is going to pollute um, uh, pollute the pollute the rivers and and the ground and drink drinking water. There are about eighty of these sites across the UK are handling, um, and this is a fact: 20, 122 billion litres of mine water every year. Um, the material processes of aeration, oxidisation, and sedimentation are performed in these sites, preventing the pollution of important water sources, drinking water, 300 kil kilometers of, of rivers uh, as well, from being choked with this ochreous, orange-colored sludge. The site des designed to perform this function um, efficiently. So long stepped cascades maximize contact the water has with oxygen uh, in the air. So huge, and these huge settling lago lagoons are designed to allow the oxidizing particles of ochre to fall, sink uh, by gravity, separating from and le leaving a the clean water on top. So the site uh, is like an accidental man-made ochre factory, um, collecting and organizing an accumulation Accumulated uh, accumulation of iron oxides in, in, in these sedimenting tanks. So it's a sort of inadvertent yet unavoidable pigment production site uh, of an industrial proportion. 5,000 tons of iron waste are produced by these mines, by the mines around the whole country um, every year. Um, and the environmental management of this material which is dealt with by the coal authority, the old coal board, is an industrial scale land pollution remediation pro uh, program that will go on for decades, you know, possibly hundred, hundreds of years. Um, from another perspective, um, it's a giant watercolor pan in the ground. So um, this method of particles sinking in water is called levigation. It's an old technology that was used for gradiating coarse material uh, from fine, fine materials. Um, uh, and, and Stokes law is a, is a way of, uh, it's an equation to calculate the size of particles by holding the, the ratio between the viscosity of water and the constancy of gravity alongside the time that it takes for a single individual particle to sink. Um, over a given distance, so you can you, know, you can sort of judge judge how big a particle is, how heavy a particle is, if you measure that um, that 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 distance. Um, so coarser particles sink, and fast, fast, finer ones fall more slowly. Um, it's called uh, uh, the very fine particles sit in in a sort of Brownian motion, a constant state of agitation. So they're sort of at, at the atomic level, that they'll never settle. They're always just hovering in space, in the space of the, of the water, never falling. So they're trapped in this continual kind of leaping motion in water. Um, and you can see this because water stays cloudy, right, over time. So the stepped terraces of ochre lagoons contain decreasing densities of ochreous material until the treated water eventually runs clear and, and is diverted back into the original river that it was uh, polluting in the first place. So I'm going to talk about um, some paintings that I have been making or have made um, that are kind of, um, I suppose, an attempt to visualize this, uh, think about it. I make a, a, a large batch of watercolor paint using a kilo of pigment that I've dug from one of the sites uh, in, this, in, in, in one of the drying beds and I grind this material with gum arabic. 
I want to make a tank of watercolour one metre deep so that I can see what happens um, as the particles of ochre sink. And I'm trying to understand how colour is formed, what it's made of, and how does it behave when they are hidden from view. Um, so a kind of revealing of uh, what goes on uh, beyond our, 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 our sight. Um, so this begins a series of watercolour paintings that organise and index the movement of colour within the medium of the water, sort of tracking the journey of falling particles of water takes, to, uh, a, a little a particle takes to uh, descend in water. So I buy a large plastic bin from the local shop, fill this with watercolour that I've made, and suspend a sheet of paper into the bin until its bottom touches the edges and then tape it in place and go home for the night. In the morning, um, in the morning, I um, carefully lift the paper from the still cloudy watercolour and a faint tide mark is visible at the top edge of the paper and this drift of colour falls down across the paper as I pull it, gently pull it out of the tank. And the water drains away, revealing an image of the submerged falling pigment particles caught in the tooth of the paper, adhering to the absorbent surface and this V-shaped valley dips through the centre of the painting. Um, and as it appears, the paper kind of folds or, or rolls with the movement of the, of the water. It develops channels and valleys and edges. Um, so the paper is a sort of membrane with its own physical idiosyncrasies. It's sensitized to the watery events in the plastic bin. Together, the skin of the submerged paper and the suspended pigment in water recording movement and time, weight, gravity, and the action uh, of material. So large, heavy pigment particles sink to the bottom and smaller, lighter particles stay suspended in longer, eventually fusing towards the top of the paper. Um, the pigment and the paper are bound together in a sort of action of physical processes over time. Okay. Um, so revealing this unseen material behavior sort of forges and shapes thinking and other considerations. Um, the rusts forming in the old mines begin to travel up to the surface of the ground through the geological levels and they release their color into the rivers and lakes. This is like another sign. This ochreous rust um, depicts events below ground, points to an unseen, points to a fading memory, a network of mines worked for hundreds of millions of tons of coal, fueling furnaces that effectively accelerated the expansion of uh, the British imperialism and the exploitation of the colonized world. So the mines beneath these now green valleys were the first industrial, industrialized coal mines in the world. At the turn of the last century, more coal was extracted in this 2,500 square kilometers of land than any other place on earth. South Wales supplied nearly all the coal exported for use in, uh, in Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, West Africa, India, Middle and Far East, Atlantic East, USA, West Indies, Peru, Chile, Pacific USA, East Africa, France, and the Mediterranean. Cardiff and Barry Docks were the world's largest outlet for coal exports, materially linking Welsh coal to the British imperial presence around the world, fueling colonizing activities and economic wealth of the British Empire through a practice of deregulated unequal free trade arrangements that kept down export costs, imports were kept cheap, wages low. So the work, working these mines that ran into each other over time uh, was, was, a, was exploiting every, every sea. Six bells in the valley of uh, in the valleys of Blanau, Gwent, South Wales, sometimes, sometimes described as England's first colonized country, co-opted into the, this rapacious extraction was among the last to close here in 1987. A community that was grounded in self-reliance, independence and pride has now become one of the poorest regions in the UK. These iron minerals surfacing here now 
are one of the last visible reminders of this labour and an indicator of wider economic, environmental and social effects, affects that are global as well as local. In 2017, the International Institute for Sustainable Development commissioned a study examining consequences of the consequences of mining in South Wales for, um, as a warning for uh, Shaanxi province in China, um, where a sort of similar mono-industrial uh, um, uh, land, uh, swathes of um, landscape have, uh, are facing similar, similar consequences. Um, due to the closure of collieries. And this is an area that's 60 times larger than South Wales at about 155,000 square kilometers. Square, square kilometers. So the, re the report states that the local economy is no longer sustainable and the, spa the spiral of that is generated in which economic collapse and social depriva deprivation outstrip the resources and capacity to ac ac adequately respond. Um, and it, I mean, it goes on, it goes on. It, it, it's really, uh, really kind of a damning sort of in, um, indictment of um, how the community has been really kind of uh, abandoned um, after such kind of high levels of e exploitation. So um, as former mining, miners and mining communities or, or, or that community, uh, th th as they age, the kind of memories are receding um, and the industry, the, the knowledge of the industry, sort of ta tacit knowledge of the industry is fading. So the local towns were built as a result of this expansion and with their closure, there's a loss of identity, uh, self-esteem has, uh, has, has become en endemic. So iron, the iron carried up in this water through these disrupted, extracted geological layers was, um, is really important. <laughs> And um, until 2014, it was sent to landfill. It was considered waste. It had no use and no value. So observing this material carried by flows of water in the landscape and in my studio with these, with these paintings is a means of thinking about how ochre as a tool um, can be a conduit for, uh, for, me, for, for, for carrying a sort of uh, a conduit for carrying a sort of history of past extractive actions here, uh, but also as a sign for the future effect of those ongoing practices uh, on the environment as, a, as global temperatures heat the habitat we rely on. So the mine water treatment schemes, um, this inadvertent site of pigment production has a function beyond the pragmatics of land management and pollution control. It also has, it's also a visible reminder of what this landscape once was. Uh, I, I'm going to quote from Howell Clatworthy, who is, uh, he's, he's actually now, um, he's one of the um, co-directors of um, a community interest company that we've established called Turning Landscape, which is, which is the structure that uh, is kind of managing a sort of circular economy of redistributing profits made or profits made from uh, the sale of paint that's connected to this, this, this um, reusing this, this waste material. So um, Howell said, both my grandparents were miners. They spent most of, much of their time working, much of their working day below ground. I can no longer go to those places to remember them. The buildings they worked in are also gone. Many of the beautiful public buildings they were so proud of and were educated in are also gone. Sometimes it feels like we are demolishing and burying their memories. My grandfather's bodies bore the physical scars of life underground. As a child, I was fascinated by their hands and arms, where coal had literally got un under their skin and stayed there after an injury had healed. As I get older, I realize that the scars on the landscape are nearly as precious to me as the scars on my grandfather's bodies. I want to be able to repeat the stories these scars hold to my children and grandchildren. I could not believe the iron rich waters my grandparents experienced underground all those years ago had forced their way up to the surface here at Six Bells. I was even more amazed to hear that when this water gets to the surface, it magically releases an amazing pigment. 
Sorry, I've neglected the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, this, so this soft, now soft, lovely green uh, valley belies the damage imposed underground and above ground and the wider environment. Um, but also, yeah, the loss of culture, connection, community that was both generated by and destroyed through intensive mining practices. So paradoxically, the sites themselves hold in balance the functioning of pollution control alongside the incidental ecology of diverse habitats that have become um, that sort of set in to this, this sort of new, new landscape. Um, I'm going to introduce you to these, these, these paints just in a second, but um, I want to just mention that the Greeks, got to, you've got to mention the Greeks and talk like this, um, called iron oxide or rust antipathia, meaning opposite nature. So rust, it wounds, uh, it is antipathia, it wounds and it heals. It symbolizes life and death at the same time. So the iron rising at six bells carries the memory of the mines and the history of the place, as well as containing a warning about the future. So um, um, in that kind of talk, uh, I, I'm, and these are these are two paints that um, we've made um, over the last uh, well launched on the twenty on on, on the eleventh of December twenty twenty. Um, six bells burnt ochre, which is a tube, forty mil tube of um, of uh, oil paint. Uh, it's a limited edition of a thousand tubes only. It's made with ochre from this site, which has been burnt at 600 degrees. So it, it's been transformed from yellow to red. Um, and there's a whole other story about that as well. And then secondly, and I'm just going to undo the um, thing um, so I can control my screen, um, is it's Six Bells uh, Red. Uh, ochre, uh, which is actually um, a kind of world first. It's the first red, um, it's the first mineral based, mineral water, water based um, exterior grade water emulsion paint made from 100% recycled iron um, uh, waste ochre uh, pigments from, from, that, from that site. So, yeah. So, um, and it's only an addition of, of 100, 100 tins, because we only have, a, a, at this stage, a limited amount of it. And there is the color and a painting of a wall. Um, and what I did was I put earlier, put that link into the chat, because there is actually, if you go to shop, <laughs> this is, this is, a, this is a, pit, a plug here. <laughs> you can buy this, um, you can buy this paint. and. Um, and, and the really significant thing is that if you do buy this paint, everything, or every, every penny that you spend on it um, goes directly back to um, Turning Landscape uh, Community Interest Company, which essentially kind of pays for the, the ongoing kind of production of the, of the paint and all the, the kind of related activity. So it, it really circulates it back directly from that site to that site. Um, and that is, I'm sure I've gone well over my time, but um, that's it. Unshare. Thank you so much, Tanya. <laughs> that was that was brilliant. Um, I am actually added a bucket of paint to my birthday list. If anyone wants to donate, I will accept. I, I, <laughs> must say, I personally have read your um, turning landscape into colour from cover to cover, and I, I was just amazed and enthralled by your practice. And the way you kind of interact with the landscape is really amazing. So thank you for providing some more insight into that. Um, we have time for maybe one quick question. Um, and and we could, if you guys want to, we can also ask some questions over the break, but we'd have to get back um, for um, 10 past four for the next session. But does anyone have any questions? So um, I'll just I'll quickly ask a question that I've been dying to ask, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, 
I kind of, um, when I saw the title of your paper, I did do a quick Google satellite link into Six Bells and it just, it looked like almost like um, watercolor palettes in the landscape and this nestled in this, in this bunch of green. And then looking in further into like the actual site itself, um, I could see a lot of the processes that happened there, a kind of process you kind of mimicked, um, not only in the studio, but in the laboratory as well. Um, I was just wondering, how did you navigate that um, from an arts practice kind of into weaving and how did each location inform one another? Um, uh, I think traveling a lot, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of um, miles uh, traveled, um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, what are you saying about kind of this view from above, you know, exactly what you did is exactly what I did. I looked, put the satellite, you know, I mean, I was given the, um, the, the uh, code, the code references by the coal authority because I asked them for them. I said, can I go and see these sites? Um, this is before they let me into the locked gates. But, and so I saw it from above and exactly, that's exactly what it was. It was, um, it was a monochrome, you know, it, it, it was a, a monochrome painting sitting in the ground, looking up and, and all of that, that kind of unravels and entails about um, um, kind of the history of, modernism and minimalism and you know we, we, it just sort of opened up a whole kind of uh, ranch of stuff and, and land art um, so so they, it, 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 I, I saw it as an artwork in itself or, or, or already like a ready-made I suppose um, but then you know but then there's, there's there's a lot of history there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of uh, sensitivity it turns out um, there was two two things just to mention two things about how did I approach each site and I think you know one thing was is to do sort of taxonomy and those kinds of practices of sort of collection collecting and measuring and I, I I felt very sort of consciously aware that one could end up kind of creating a collection of all the pigments across the country um you know and putting them in jars and having them and, and they'd all look different and that would be really interesting but actually as, it, as i as i started to work with individual places it, it became very obviously much more complicated than that um because you, you know you're talking about sort of the individuality of ind of individual beings um bodies places and all of that individuality and ind independence and idiosyncrasies and characteristics came out through the pigment, actually directly through the colour. That's my phone going off, brilliant. Um, sweet. Um, yeah, so, so in idiosyncrasies it, it, between different um, material materials was really, um, really, really important. Um, and, and kind of allowing their kind of differences to emerge and differences to be expressed. Um, in very kind of particular ways and so like individual paintings so, so, sort of started to um, kind of be sensitive to those differences. Perfect so I think I want to give make sure everyone gets a um, break but I'm sure that if you have any additional questions are they okay to reach out to you on yet? Yes of course I'll, I'll, I'll be here yes if, um, yeah yeah no I'm, I'm quite happy to answer anything and, and um, I, I see some comments in the um in the um in the chat so thank you for the comments so if anyone has any questions feel free to ask if everyone wants to take a break um can we all be back for 10 past um where will linda will be looking after us thank you everyone can i just add that i have put in the exhibition link into the into the chat i hope Yes, it's gone in. So if anyone wants to have a quick look um, at the exhibition, but I do recommend that you get up, have a stretch, go get a glass of water and go look out the window because we need to look after our, our eyes in this age of computers and Zoom. So we'll see you at 10 past. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laurie.
Hi, Anya. Oh. Yeah, I've um, been looking at acid mine drainage for my master's project. Oh, right, yeah. So I'm up at Fife, in Fife in Scotland. Oh, yeah. And I retrieved a load of iron hydroxide from the processing plant at Dyser. And I've been, I'm a photographer, so I've been using them as material uh, with cyanotype solution and trying to mimic um, what's going on in the spoil tips because they remain untreated. Um, the processing plant at Dyser is now unable to cope. Um, so that they've built a substation, uh, but there's issues with that as well. Uh, there's a load of dead birds and stuff um, got washed up a few weeks back. So they're working on that again. I was just wondering um, what you thought about the environmental impact, because this is, you know, as you know, it's an irreversible process. Uh, and how you think nature can respond um once this process goes untreated um are you talking about the which which process exactly well the oxidation of the iron particles oh yeah yeah i mean yeah yeah it, it's um it's it's yes as you say it's irreversible um and it's going to happen increasingly or, or it is happening increasingly all over the world where any mining is taking place and and the impact on on groundwater and rivers is is you know continues continues so it's 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 terrible really i mean um and that's in places where you can contain it relatively um you know relatively straightforwardly like uh, you know and, and where there's the infrastructure and the and the finances to be able to deal with it so you know the coal authority um, have a have this responsibility, and they have funding to build these mine water treatment sites, and they have to they they have to respond when there's an outbreak somewhere. They have to deal with it. But um, I think what was really kind of funny was that you know the waste that this process was um, you, you know these these iron particles that that was being sent to landfill. You know like. like <laughs> it's like kind of just oh here goes another and what happens when that landfill start to start to seep um so yeah i mean it it it, it, it I, I guess you know the um the the aim is to is to find something that you, to you to use this stuff for something um so it so it does kind of contain it and obviously you know i mean you know there there are industrial kind of manufacturers that could use it for cement or could use it for brick brick making or there are all sorts of processes in which it could be used and, and the coal authority using it for some of these um but you know i think i i've been interested in in what what it can how it can be used as a tool how it can be activated as a um as a as a material for thinking and for kind of triggering this uh, this kind of knowledge of 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 what what's been what's to come what's to come you know mm. yeah i mean i'm looking at using the metal well trying to look at methods to use the metal content within the yeah. photography obviously silver is a big um, pollutant within photography so yeah, looking at alternatives and with this already being a waste product, um, can it be utilized within a photographic practice? Um, mixed results, to be honest. It's very interesting what I get. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sounds great. But to get to to go to somebody who's making very accurate digital images, um, it'd be quite a compromise, I think, for the imagery produced. Yeah, I mean, if it, if it's it, it it is going to have an affect, it is going to be present in the in the process by the sound of it, because of its unwieldy kind of material um, nature. It's not going to do necessarily what you want it to do all the time. No, but that's the beauty for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, quite. Yeah, yeah. Mm, of course.
whereabouts uh, is the whereabouts are you are you um, referring to in Fife? It's east, well, the site I've been working on is East Weems, so that was the Michael Collier, that closed in 67, then the remaining structures were demolished 2001, um, but the spoil tip overlooks the River Forth, so whilst the mine water gets treated, the spoil tip doesn't, yeah. so any rainwater seepage is going into the Forth, um, but yeah, there's been a bit of regeneration, um, you know, there's been less fishing, um, a lot less transport on the river. I mean, we've had two whales um, this summer. So, yeah, it seems a shame that we, we seem to be having this regeneration, yet there's still, I mean, the whole county was a, a mining county. Yeah. There's all these spill tips that remain untreated. Yeah. Do you know the Bings in um, Lothian? But West yeah, Lothian. of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yeah. Yeah. Talking of spoil tips, I mean they're 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 in they've they've taken on a kind of um sort of more, almost iconic status now, haven't they? And uh, I think there's quite a lot of resistance to them being um uh, kind of recapitalised <clears throat> uh, into like road building. Yeah. Well, John Latham was instrumental in that, um, but there's a lot of rare yeah. and exotic species yes and they so yeah yeah it's fascinating that great? yeah they're, yeah 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 they're little kind of unique ecosystems of, of, their, of them themselves which is is fantastic but yeah his argument was just leave it alone you know yeah, yeah, nature yeah. nature will repair itself but I, I do wonder if that's maybe a step too far with the amount of damage that that's been done through extraction well, I mean, his position was really kind of to leave them as they are as a as a kind of monument. Yeah, uh, an yeah. artwork. Uh, yeah, uh, so as a as a kind of um, active gesture, as opposed to a kind of neglective, passive gesture. Um, but indeed, you know, it, it it's a. Uh, I mean, it, it one of the sites that I've been working very closely with is 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 called Cut Hill. Mm -hmm. um, which actually is very close to the to the um, to the Bings. It's in it's in visual kind of view yeah. of the five sisters, um, and um, you know there's 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 an interesting kind of dialogue there between this monumental sculptural object in the ground and this kind of potential sort of monochrome monochrome painting yeah. that, that's, that's uh, got a whole set of different qualities, but, but it is containing, I mean, the, from a, an environmental point of view, I suppose there is, there is, it is containing, um, containing the material mm -hmm. that would otherwise, um, but you're yeah, right, you know, and what, what, what happens to all these other, um, these other seepages and um, leakages that are going yeah. on, unknown ones and unknown ones. It's a big subject. Can I um, drop you an email on you? Uh, of course, yes, do, yeah. Is that on your website? Yeah. yeah be... right, I'll pick it up. Thank you. Thanks. I just I don't know if Tanya's still there. Thanks for the lovely comment um, about um, the work. Much appreciated. I don't know how to do a I don't know how to do a thumbs up, but that's very oh, thank nice. Thank you, Anya. No, that was just fascinating, and yeah, just that whole idea. Uh, we always think we can throw things away or get rid of things, but there is just no way. And I, you know, your work's revealing that in such a kind of potent and very beautiful way as well that is incredible color but um yeah no really really fascinating stuff i'm very curious about the works around you as well i know i know we're in your world yeah. <laughs> i keep finding myself distracted over your shoulder uh, well it's it's kind of a it's kind of um 
uh, yeah, I think a, a case of just uh, sort of infusing. I was, wanted to infuse the talk with the sound of the water coming from the site uh, and the colours that are also from the site. So that's, that was what that was for. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you very much for that um, discussion that we've had during the break, um, and it's great that it continued on. Um, welcome back to the penultimate panel of our conference. All our panel members are researchers at Plymouth. Rachel is a multidisciplinary artist working with moving image and photographic and other processes. Her work is made in response to the experience of natural phenomena, the horizon and watery places. Kate is an artist whose research is focused on sea caves in the Torbay Marine Conservation Zone, where she pays close attention to geologies and entities and different timescales and how they can help us reframe our present ecological crisis. And Mary's research focuses on the interconnections between borders, lines, space and memory using photography and autobiographical writing. So can we start please with Rachel? Sure. Hi again. Okay. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I'm going to start by playing a film. Can you all see that? Okay. Great.
So, um, high water respond, record, reflect, documents a swimming experience that was filmed from my perspective with some willing participants that I'd swum with during the course of the past series of lockdowns in 2020-21. Having acclimatized to the fluctuating temperatures and the wide range of climatic conditions, swimming through the summer, autumn, winter, and into early spring, and then consequently moving into the water at the end of March was a much less daunting prospect. Fortunately, high pressure meant that the day was unseasonably warm, calm and clear. From my diary entry on the 30th of March, 2021, I noted that the maximum temperature was 18 degrees with a minimum temperature of eight degrees, wind south four miles per hour, daylight hours, 12 hours and 46 minutes. Arriving at the empty beach after sunrise, a group had time and space to spread out by the shoreline, prepare and change into appropriate clothing, which for me was a swimsuit and woolen beret, my habitual attire for swimming in the colder months. As a skin swimmer, I like to feel the sensation of water against my body. It's about connecting my body to the wider bodies of the world's waters and optimize the immersive phenomenological experience. Astridian Amandas explores the notion of water embodiment by examining the way that all the waters of the world are entwined and interconnected and how our bodies have permeable skins that absorb as well as expel bodily fluids, describing our bodies as wet and spongy. Liminality is a com concept that provides a useful framework to the stages of the swim as well as this time in the world and the place by the sea, and maybe all swimming experiences. The possibility of a new experience undertaken by a small group of swimmers who came together to overcome the uncertainty of how the cold water and huge tide might affect us. Following Victor Turner's model about liminality, the initial phase severance involved waiting by the shore in the liminal space or the marginal world between the land and the sea a place that Rachel Carson in The Edge of the Sea describes as a mutable space, which remains an elusive and indefinable boundary. Breaking away from the relative warm of the beach and the morning air, the known environment, entailed entering the water in order to experience the highest tide at precisely 8.15 in the morning. The second, the threshold, was experienced in the sea the place where aquatic life exists, swimming out to the horizon, uncertain of the effect of the cold water and what non-human and human life we might encounter. Then the final stage, the return, the post-liminal phase, whereby the individual comes back to shore with new knowledge. We swam in breathtakingly cool nine degrees Celsius, crystal clear aquamarine water towards the rising sunlight as it emerged through the morning mist. Looking down through the water, the sea below was deep emerald green. The sandy of the surface of the seabed layered with seagrass beds, home to seahorses, very near to shore. Before and during the swim, everyone was chattering with animated excitement, feeling a great sense of occasion, marking a threshold for change and renewal, growing light and longer warmer days, heading towards midsummer feeling a sense of freedom, knowing that the lockdown would start to ease incrementally with the prospect of more liberty and mobility to come. What lay ahead felt uncertain, feeling a sense of optimism, hope and looking forward, both physically and metaphorically, as our horizons were on the cusp of expanding again. After the swim, I felt the warmth from the sun as it rose in the sky. I recorded the responses of the swimmers, simply asking them, what they had experienced, felt and learned when they returned to the shore following this new phenomenological encounter. I imagined the highest tide of the year would be experienced as a stupendous surge of water reaching the shoreline and overwhelming our bodies. In fact, the water was so calm and the flow so gentle that the water enveloped rather than overpowered us. Reflecting on the experience while looking out to the horizon from the shore, I recalled a sunrise swim a few years earlier during the autumn equinox with writer and daily sea swimmer Philip Hall on the other side of the bay at Meadford Beach in Torquay during the tail, an ambitious multidisciplinary arts event organised by Situations that took place throughout locations in Torbay in September 2017. 
based on the writings of Philip Hoare in his book that was published that year, Rising Tide, Falling Star. Each weekend during the tale, Hoare made an open invitation for people to join him at dawn to swim in the sea. He has an enduring fascination with our connection to the sea and describes how we first sense the world through that fluid filling our mother's belly. We hear through the sea inside her. He further elucidates how the sea is an extension of ourselves. This experience made a profound and indelible impression on me and has informed my subsequent swimming adventures. The final phase of filming was on return to the shoreland. I filmed the water rushing, ebbing and flowing on the strand line, then recorded the sound of the water in the intertidal zone. This embodied practice considers Donald Schoen's approach to reflection, both in action during the activity and then following the action as a reflection on the physical and metaphorical encounter of the phenomenon. After subsequent research, I discovered that the tide at its highest point is slack. The tides rise and fall over a six hour period from low to high diurnally, following the rule of twelfths. This consequently determines the flow of water throughout the tidal cycle, essential knowledge for swimmers, ensuring safety and acknowledging the power and potential dangers of the sea and the ocean. A raw edit of this film was originally shared at the High Water Online Symposium, a project organised by Arctic Earth, Tidelines and the Sustainable Earth Institute to mark the highest equinoctial tide of the year on the 30th of the 3rd, 2021. It provided an opportunity for artists, writers, collectors and sea lovers to reflect and share their stories, performances, encounters and experience of the sea from across the world over the duration of the full tide. It's exactly three months later today on the 30th of June and we have now passed the summer solstice when the daylight hours peaked at 16 hours and 23 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Just a reminder to everybody to please put questions in the chat and then we'll come back to the questions at the end. But if we could um, harvest some now, that'd be great. So could we now hear from Kate, please? Thank you, Linda. Thanks. I'll just share my screen. So my talk is entitled Sirens, Crossing Thresholds of Multi-Entity Ethics. In Bodies of Water, Astrid and Imanis writes, we are the watery world, metonymically, temporarily, partially and particularly. Acknowledging the problematizing pronoun we, Naimanis continues, counted here are not only humans and other animals, plants, fungi, protoptists, but also geological and meteorological bodies. As Donna Haraway remarks, who are we, what are we, who and what are we that is not only human? And she adds, from where are you speaking? That where is connected to a multiplicity of perspectives for every experience and situation. In our time of climate breakdown and mass species extinctions, it is hard to think about the right course of action to take. But Naimanis and Haraway's call to acknowledge interdependencies, our implication and entanglements is vital if we are to accept responsibility. Sirens is my title for a new body of work and is a response to a coastal swim into intertidal sea caves and is the focus of my talk for waterways. Made with the field recordings from those journeys into the caves, Sirens is what Elaine Gann speaks of as a mode of thinking through artistic practice that might allow for this pronoun, we, to shift. In autumn 2019, I invited a group of artists, academics and researchers to swim with me into a series of marine caves at Livermead in the Torbay Marine Conservation Zone. During our crossing, we swim closely together, bounded by practice as ritual making, new rites for troubling troubled times. Ritual plays a role in making visible a certain order in a specific context in showing the proven way of doing something. For scholar Catherine Bell, ritualization is a way of acting that is designed and orchestrated to distinguish and privilege what is being done in comparison to other, usually more quotidian activities. 
In my field notes I have written, it is early evening. The four of us slip into the rough water at high tide and swim together into the first chamber. The waves are too wild. We can't enter any of the others, but swim to all their entrances before turning back. When we climb from the sea, the moon is rising, huge, red, the harvest moon. The rocky shores of Tor Bay's intertidal zone are transmutable territory of porous and unfixed boundaries, and its caves are of both the land and the sea, made and unmade by the tides. Here, climate breakdown and ecological entanglements can be read in the action of the waves and the rapid changes to the land's edges. My intention for our watery trips is as journeys towards thinking with care and aligns with feminist post-humanities described by Cecilia Uspir and Marietta Radomska in their 2019 essay. They comment, long-standing feminist theory practices of decolonizing the domains of the universal man idea mark a particularly critical and creative source for the planetary forms of post-humanities we claim is needed. Drawing upon feminist thinking is helpful in this effort of thinking with care. As Maria Puig de la Bella Casa writes, in feminist discussions, as well as in activism, the politics of caring remain at the heart of concerns with exclusions and critiques of power dynamics in stratified worlds. When I consider what kind of thinking might guide us in an era of degradation and loss at this particular site in time and place, I'm doing so through prioritizing the imagination and challenging the hierarchical and exceptionalist thinking aligned to Western enlightenment. I do this through experimental ways of data gathering and expanded notions of field research. This challenging aligns with my thesis, which asks what arts practice can do when it is so tangled up in the complexities of our long and continuing dependence on extraction the exploitation of humans and non-humans and consumption, which have become a transformative force on our ecologies. Crossing their fluid borders, thresholds. As we cross the threshold and swim into the first chamber, we disturb a large colony of feral pigeons, rock doves returned to the ancient brachia cliffs from railway arches and municipal buildings whose sharp wing clap and flutter breaks the soft, repetitive noise of their purred vocalising. We spin round and round in the water, gazing upwards to the high roof. The air is filled with floating downy feathers. Thresholds are a familiar concept in the physical sciences where they have been investigated since the late 18th century when, for example, chemist, physicist and meteorologist John Dalton described the state of change from liquid to vapour that is evaporation. Changes of state in physics are often called critical points, reflecting that they are sudden and instant. An ecological threshold looks at the impact of habitat loss, modification and fragmentation on biodiversity. The Resilience Alliance, an international collective of research scientists from social and ecological disciplines, has described changes of state which define an ecological threshold as points which, when passed, cause a system to flip to a different state. For example, when woodland habitat was gradually cut down, the corresponding steady decline in the species richness of birds and mammals saw a sudden dramatic crash when their habitat reached between 10% to 30% cover. Crossing the threshold of the sea cave. At the crossing point, the threshold or place of entering a marine cave conditions change, providing a niche for assemblages of organisms where they will be protected from high solar radiation and the extremes of doubt, drought <laughs> and atmospheric changes in temperature. Sea cave thresholds are places where inhabitants find comfort and refuge, an ecological niche. On entering the marine cave, threshold sentience brims with a wealth of sensations in the haptic atmospheres. 
In conversation, open water swimmer Sophie Pierce describes entering the chamber. At the first cave, you're entering under an arch and you get an incredible light effect. It's quite a well-known phenomenon that divers talk about. They look as though they're lit. The caves look as though they're lit from underneath. So you've got this amazing glow of light just under the water where the cave walls are. And you swim in and you're in a cavernous space with the water gurgling and running up and down the sort of inner caves. And it can be a kind of groaning noise. The water is constantly churning through and you're moving and being moved by the water. Sirens is an acknowledgement of an ecology of the senses, how humans and non-humans sense the environment, what it is possible to sense and why we sense the world. In the three ecologies, Felix Guattari suggests that an ecology of the virtual is just as pressing as ecologies of the visible world. And Catherine Yusuf calls for the need for an ethics of the insensible and says, if we are to create new practices of sensations and new sensibilities, we need to understand something of how sense is enrolled into our habits of thought and theories of materiality. We need to engage with the insensible the force or motivation oscillating between the material and virtual, inhuman and human, organic and non-organic, time and the untimely. To me as an artist and in my practice as research, thinking with means attempting a disruption of the Western coded patterns of thinking the world, a sensorial estrangement and resensitization and a readiness to be changed by the attempted encounter and that's thanks to Cecilia Uspe, with the sensoria, um, the attempted encounter with the sensoria of others. The we, use of terms insensible. We are at a threshold collectively, globally. We are in a state of violent change. In the shore area, I can clearly apprehend the pressures of practices which are become normalized. Yet working to the rhythms of the tide in this porous, breathing, diverse habitat, in the undersides, opening beneath dense urban occupation, I think with and think what can be unlearned by imaginatively engaging with the environment of cave threshold, inhabiting cave threshold in the now. Um, and thank you for that, Kate, that was very interesting. And now we turn to Mary for her presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Linda. Um, after an absolutely wonderful uh, and enjoyable and intense afternoon, I thought I would take you uh, on a beach walk. Uh, so the sea has always held a fascination. The melody and rhythm of the waves, the distant horizon and the bracing clean air. It is a place for reflection and for renewal. I live in the coastal village of Shoreland in South Devon. It has a population of around 1,700 souls and a number that can easily double in the height of summer with people drawn to the sandy beaches and relatively warm seas where they can relax on, in or by. Visiting the coast was once the exclusive privilege of the rich, but with the growing railway networks in Victorian times, the coast became more accessible. Seaside holidays grew and are still popular today. The beach I visit the most is Ness Beach, an eastward facing stretch of sand between two sandstone headlands. It is a secluded place and access through what is known as Smuggler's Tunnel. When the east wind blows, the waves can crash onto the shore with immense power. But when the winds are light, the waves appear harmless as they gently lap onto the shore. This walk I am taking you on was on World Oceans Day on the 8th of June, and the air temperature is 16 degrees Celsius, with the sea being a chilly 13.6 degrees Celsius. And no, I did not go swimming. When at the beach, it is impossible not to think of artists who have used the coast as inspiration. And part of this talk is sharing with you those who inspire my practice. 
Today, as soon as I step back out into the light from the long dark tunnel, I am instantly reminded of the impressionist painter Gustave Courbet, who spent time painting expansive images showing the mirror effect of the sea and sky. In the beach, three quarters of the canvas is taken up with the sea and sky as it sits on this narrow strip of sand and detritus. Whenever I am at the beach, in fact, any beach, I always think of the Great Wave, a block print dating from 1831 by Hoxai. It is one of my favorite pieces of art and one that reminds constantly of the power of the sea. Small fishing vessels appear engulfed by an immense wave in the shadow of Mount Fuji. Through intricate carvings, the wave comes to life and the detail is delicate, creating a brush-like appearance. Block printing is a slow, methodical process, print overlay to create the final art, very much like negative overlay in a photographic practice. It is a manifestation of slow art and one that is striking. Today, the light is changing quickly and the way the sun is now through the clouds gives pause to think of Gustave Le Grey, who as both painter and photographer brought his artistic talent to the sea and by using a double negative technique, created these brooding seascapes. In the photographic journal of 1857, a critic wrote, a plain unbroken prairie of open seas, lined and rippled with myriad of smiling trails, dark and sombrous and profoundly calm, smooth as a tombstone. I spend a lot of time looking at the horizon. I always have. Therefore, Kimoto's large format, long exposure seascapes evoke a connection for me and a dream of a far distant horizon, inviting the viewer to contemplate the myths and meanings of time and space. An almost empty space, so you are able to pour in your own thoughts and interpretations. And the beach is an ideal location for thoughts like this to pour in and out. I come to the beach to walk, and I usually walk with my head down, eyes on the lookout for stones that attract my attention. I've been collecting pebbles for as long as I can remember. I do not consider myself an avid collector, just an itinerant gatherer. So around the house, there are jars of stones from my travels, both home and abroad. I find the feel of pebbles appealing and find pleasure in my growing collection. The collecting of pebbles and shells along a beach is often seen as a childhood experience. The inquisitive spirit of childhood, as we all make chance finds that expand our knowing and understanding of the world. During the Victorian age of colonial expansion, plant, shell and fossil hunters brought back treasures to the delights of their wealthy patrons. Mary Anning of Lyme Regis became an expert in paleontological studies and advanced in her field. The best time to collect pebbles is when the tide is out. When they appear abandoned or shipwrecked at the high tide mark along the beach. The high tide line is a blurred boundary in a continual state of flux. The shoreline is a series of boundaries within boundaries. The sun beats down today the day of this walk. Family groups are gathering and there is the shriek of children splashing in the shallows, oblivious to the warmth of the day. They're having so much fun. Further along the beach, a mother and daughter are obviously looking for pebbles. And so once again, the cycle of collecting is passed from generation to generation. All stones are unique with no two identical. The shapes can be similar, but there are subtleties and differences in size, appearance and texture. Each stone is an untold story, with each having a history unique unto itself. My stone collection pulls me to a time and place, and these memories wash over me like the incoming tide and take me back to that time and place. I collect stones for myself, and as spontaneous gifts 
particularly for family members at home. Why is collecting synonymous with the seashore? Quite often linked inextricably with the pleasure of finding, the quest to find something beautiful, oddly shaped or appealing. Their importance is not deemed a monetary value, but in the joy of a chance find. Walter Benjamin wrote, the most profound enchantment for the collector is the looking at individual items within a magic circle. The magic circle being the order that comes from the chaos of possibilities. All the pebbles are finds, removed from their natural landscape to find a new home in the landscape of a collection. Every object that enters your personal space acquires significance and your relationship with it creates meaning, history and memories that can be revisited by touch. The humble pebble becomes a treasured possession. The American artist and collector, Mark Dion, to mark the opening of the Tate Modern in 1999, undertook a commission that aimed to link the existing Tate Gallery with its sister gallery further downstream along the Thames. The project relied on volunteers scouring the tideline of the river to claim objects that over the centuries had found themselves in the river. It was a painstaking dig of archeological proportions involving collecting, sorting, cataloging and archiving thousands of objects spanning many centuries. Here on the beach, pebbles wash up, possibly from distant shores, who knows, and by currents and tides happen by chance to arrive on their speech and by chance again, become part of my collection. Contemporary artists look to the sea to explore the various themes of light, power and bordering. The Irish filmmaker Mary McLean made a film for the Wapping Project in London, where she looked at the incoming and outgoing tide as a border, and with her giant pencil created a line to mark its limits. This transitory borderline reveals the elusive nature of borders opposed to the indelible marks on printed maps. Art has come full circle in this haunting image by the contemporary Welsh artist Sarah Evans, who with oils and brush capture the power of the raging sea and the darkening clouds of the distant horizon. Art is about searching and exploring, seeing what others are doing and how their work can inspire and extend your own thinking and sense of knowing. It is through events such as this that our work can be showcased and dialogues and connections can be brought together. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, and thank you for sharing your thinking and your practice today. Um, so we've got um, some questions that we need to ask you. Um, I've asked people in the chat to put comments in. And I'm just gonna mention um, that Laurie has mentioned something about Deleuze, Kate, um, talking about your research um, and sort of really saying that you have translated that, you've made uh, a very complicated um, thinking into something that we can understand. I just wondered, would you be willing to talk a little bit further on that? Um, I think it'd be really nice to hear from Laurie as well, actually. Um, and I just read Laurie's comment and saw um, that he talked about that translation. And I suppose, that's the aim of the um, practices research that I'm doing is to work through fieldwork or my expanded notions of fieldwork and field research. And that's what I'm bringing to the writing. So the, the kind of theoretical thinking um, and the, the kind of like application of the theoretical thinking is coming through that um, an attempt at um, kind of disrupting notions of, of data gathering and field working. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, and just thanks, thanks, Laurie, for that um, comment. And I just also wanted to say um, a really big apology to Mary there for completely disrupting <laughs> the beginning of her talk by rustling and because um, I'd forgotten to turn my microphone off. So, yeah, sorry for that, Mary. 
Well, well um, Laurie's um, comment was echoed also by Gail. So just to say that, you know, that's um, obviously um, something that everybody is appreciating. I just wanted to turn to Rachel, if it's possible to just, Rachel, can you tell us a little bit more about this liminality that obviously offers a lot to you? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, it's, it feels like it, it's a really useful model I actually worked with um, during a master's in contemporary art practice. Uh, the idea of the triadic um, kind of phases of um, an experience and the kind of the feeling of being on the, you know, before you do it, it's always that kind of precarious feeling of not knowing and, and kind of overcoming that um, sort of barrier, psychological, physical barrier to then kind of go into an experience. And the more I swim regularly, the more I realize that actually liminality and the kind of triadic process, it seems to be really um, kind of interconnected and it seems to work as a sort of a, an idea and a concept, um, you know, sort of moving from, from the land into the sea and the kind of the, the shift from uh, being in the vertical plane to the horizontal and the kind of, release from gravity and the kind of the feeling of floating but um with the kind of you know with the release there's also incredible danger it's not just a kind of a a safe place of kind of weightlessness it's also a dangerous place and then I think with every swim and every um every time I kind of go in and come out of the water I always come come out with a whole new sort of feeling of experience and kind of energy and um yeah, reflection. So I, I, it feels like it's a really useful um, kind of process and, and theory to kind of work with for what I'm doing, mm. if that makes sense. It does. And and just to say, Kayla, Kayla Parker has mentioned in the chat, Mary, that she really likes your idea of collecting as an aspect, uh, something that you've inherited, you know, something that is part of um, a family history. So can you tell us a bit more about that, Mary? Well, I, I should have kind of lined up my jars behind me, but I thought that was a bit weird if I, if I did that. Um, but, you know, I, I've got stones here that I collected when I was a little Mary, you know, way, way back when. And, you know, it's just, I've always had something in my pocket. Um, I've been looking through some of my paternal family photographs and um, there's me with an ancient camera around my neck, aged about three, and also in my hand, I have a pebble. So I really can't, um, I haven't grown very much, I suppose, really, from that. I've just kind of, you know, just, I love my pebbles. And, you know, I probably should sit here and come up with some amazing theoretical reason as to why but I can't, I just like the feel of them. I like having them in my hand. I like the idea that I go somewhere and I bring a little piece of it back. I'm not very good with tatty souvenirs, but I need a piece, I need a pebble or I need um, a bit of sand. First time I went to Iceland was the first time I saw black sand. And I, and I went back and I found little containers. You know, I, I literally emptied my lunchbox and I filled up my lunchbox with sand because I'd never seen it before. And it's just this idea of remembering. And, you know, at my grandmother's funeral, I put a stone, one of my stones from Iceland in the coffin with her, because it was that idea of traveling and feeling secure. And, you know, there's a thing about having a worry pebble. And, you know, it's that kind of idea of having something that you can hold and rub and move around in your hands um you know and it just makes you feel secure and grounded so apologies i don't know if that answers your question i went on a bit of a ramble but it was really <laughs> insightful and also extremely tactile mary i completely i think many of us would completely get where you're coming from um there they are yeah um julie devon says pebbles are a very mindful and they're grounding too so we're with you and harriet says it's a jewish tradition to place a stone on a grave so so mary you know you, and, you've heard something important there i feel significant and every time i visit my grandmother's grave she gets a pebble you know it's one of those things i'm not jewish but i love that tradition that idea of giving something 
Thank you, Mary. Well, that brings our session to a close. Um, it's now 16.50, so we're going to hand over to Dr. Carol Baker for our fifth panel of the afternoon. Okay, thank you, Linda. Um, it, I have great pleasure in introducing the final panel of the day, um, Dr. Mandy Bloomfield. Uh, Mandy is an Associate Professor and in Modern and Contemporary Literature here at the University of Plymouth, and she's Programme Leader for the MA in Environmental Humanities. Mandy's current research explores how modern and contemporary poetry engages the dilemmas of our present moment of ecological emergency. She's working on a monograph uh, currently related to poetry and cultural imaginaries of the sea, provisionally entitled An Oceanic Poetics for the Anthropocene. Mandy's paper today Waves are unfolding sentences. The poetry of Craig Santos Perez discusses recent work by the indigenous Chamorro poet Craig Santos Perez, born on the island of Guam, which is in the western North Pacific Ocean, part of the Mariana Islands archipelago. Mandy explores how this poetry draws on Chamorro imaginaries of the sea to suggest forms of multi-species connectivity, collectivity, even as it registers the damage and violence of the American capitalist military presence in Guam and Hawaii. So, pass over to Mandy. Thank you. We hear you. Mute, you're mute. <laughs> Well, this year and a half on Zoom and I still haven't got, got, got the hang of that. Um, hello everybody and thank you for that wonderful introduction, um, Carol. I'm just going to um, share my screen and hope that this is going to work. Um, so can, is that visible to everybody? Just want to check. Um, Hi everybody, um, I feel like a, an, an odd one out here in, in many ways and in the ways that will I, I guess become uh, obvious. Um, but I want to just kind of take a moment at the, at the beginning and take up some of my time by thanking all of today's speakers. Um, I've been uh, dazzled and overwhelmed by the array of absolutely fascinating work today. I'm completely jealous of all of you and 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 your 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 artistic practice as research which uh, for me is a is a path not taken in my in my own um, career um, I have become a, a literary critic but to have kind of massive affinities um, and uh, desire actually to, to be to be a practicing artist I guess I'm just not um, but as a as a literary critic my work is all about interpreting others work and that that is what I will be doing um, today and also it, it's it's mostly about words I mean I do write about um, visual art sometimes and, and connect up with with poetry um, but not as much as I'd like, I suppose. And so I hope that um, my little contribution is a sort of final provocation or a, an invitation to really connect with um, uh, the thinking today. And that, that there are lots of com kind of common orientation points, I think, as will become clear. Um, but to kind of connect the thinking and practices that we've heard about today with other aesthetic forms and also um, with a very distant distant geography and thank you Carol for that um, geography lesson about where, where Guam is <laughs> because uh, that's something that will come up um, and I, I, I hope it will become evident that, uh, that the work that I'm doing does connect with a lot of your thinking and a lot of your practices um, through water, waves, bodies of water, um, contaminations, geology and and more and uh, just as a kind of note to Mary um, I last when we were allowed to travel the last time I went to Paris put a put a pebble that I'd picked up off the beach and I put a pebble on the on the grave of the modernist poet Gertrude Stein um, <laughs> so, which is which is heaving with pebbles I would say worth a visit um, well done. <laughs> okay so, <laughs> 
So I will, uh, I'll kind of begin with a, a little bit of framing, I suppose. So the project that, that I'm working on at the moment is to do with the sea, poetry, ecology and social and environmental injustice. Um, as Carol mentioned, I'm working on a book length study that examines how the poetry of the past hundred years investigates changing cultural relationships with the sea um, and explores possibilities for more ethical um, orientations towards the terraqueous planet. And the context for this, of course, is that the seas are pretty marginalized in, in, in Western cultural and environmental imaginaries, um, even though the oceans have been absolutely central to the developments of capitalist modernity. But if we're to understand the long entangled histories of, of global capitalism and its contemporary manifestations, and especially if we're going to um, engage with planetary ecological crisis, then we really need, I think, to cultivate uh, different cultural relationships with the ocean and with other bodies of water. And I think you're all doing that in your practices. Um, uh, my argument is, and, and I would extend this to visual arts as well, um, but, but my argument in the book is that poetries of the sea can help us to think through these dilemmas um, and perhaps even model alternatives to our kind of cultural forgetting of, of ocean spaces. Um, so as an example of the sort of thing that this involves, I'm going to go into detail <laughs> um, rather than kind of give a, give a survey. Uh, so lately I've been working on the wonderful, wonderful poetry of this guy, Craig Santos Perez. Um, as uh, Carol introduced, he's an indigenous Chamorro poet from Guam. Um, I've given you the map there. I'd be interested to know actually how many people did know where Guam um, was before <laughs> today. Uh, so you could just put that in the chat if, if you like, I did or I didn't, that would be really interesting. Um, it's just this, it's this small Western Pacific island colonized by the Spanish in early modernity, uh, the US since the late uh, 19th century, and it's now a strategic US military base. And if you just look at this map, you can kind of figure out why that is. Um, it, it, it came into our consciousness in, in the news when there was a standoff between um, North Korea and America a, a couple of years ago, a, a kind of nuclear, a moment of, of nuclear standoff. Um, so in my contribution today, I want to think through some examples from the most recent book in Craig Santos Perez's poetic series, From Unincorporated Territory, which he's been working on for over 10 years. Um, and just to just to kind of give you a sense of this, this is a long serial poem, uh, four books here. Um, it's a substantial body of, of work um, and it kind of has these wonderful covers, which, which are all very kind of oceanic and island islandy. Um, the one I'm going to be looking at is this, this most recent one, Lucal. Um, all of the, the books in this long poetic series focus on the home, uh, on the homeland island of Guam, but also the wider um, Pacific and the histories of colonization and neo-colonialism here. Um, as I said, I'm just going to, to look at the most recent one, Lucao, uh, published in 2017. And this focuses on the gestation and birth of the poet's first child um, in the context of escalating environmental crisis. And I want to example, I want to examine, sorry, how the examples that I'm going to look at map specific networks of socio-ecological harm in Oceania's commodified and militarized spaces. I also want to suggest how through this activity, the work performs a decolonial impact on other forms of lucal, and lucal is a tomorrow word meaning procession, um, which weaves po points of contact between ancestral legacies, new life and renewed possibilities for collective resistance and becoming. Um, so I'm going to go straight into the poetry. As you'll see, it's, it's formally experimental, it's visually experimental, it uses um, typography and, and page layout in quite interesting ways. Perez also in, in his books uses various kinds of 
collage materials. Um, I'm trying to find one now, I can't. Uh, maps um, and other, other, kinds of, other kinds of things. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of, of the work, the, these examples, sorry, it's raining really hard in the background. I don't know if that's interfering. Um, these examples I'm going to show you on PowerPoint slides, but in case that is not, you can't see them very well. I did ask Mary and Mary sent around um, a handout of the poems beforehand. So if that's easier and you have it to hand, you can refer to, to that instead. Um, okay, so, the title of my paper, Waves Are Unfolding Sentences, comes from one of the poems um, in the collection of which I'm showing on, on this slide here. Um, and it provides a starting point and a frame for thinking about how Perez's poetics enmesh human corporeality and cultural identity with the material presence of the ocean in Oceania as a geophysical force, as a changing multi-species habitat, and as, a, and as a space circumscribed by colonial and neo-colonial power. The lines come from a strand within the book called E Tini Tuhon, which is Chamorro for In the Beginning. And all of the poems, there are a number of poems which appear under this title, and they comprise disjointed phrases which interweave discourses of childbirth with terminologies for measuring, modeling, and navigating ocean and island space. The lines, waves are unfolding sentences, reference a birthing discourse, which uses the wave as a metaphor for contractions. Um, but uh, these, these waves are not just a metaphor for contractions. They're also ocean waves, which traverse and connect the space of Oceania, this uh, sea of islands. And they are unfolding sentences, modes of procession in language and understanding as the wave moves across geographical and also corporeal space. So these lines encapsulate an enmeshment of human body, of ocean and island space, and of language and temporality. And I think it's worth just making a link here to another poet writing in a neo-colonial island context, albeit with a really different geography and history, uh, Caribbean poet Kamal Brathwaite. Brathwaite has proposed and theorized the notion of tidalectics as a rethinking of historical materialist dialectics in relation to Caribbean history and geography. He outlines tidalectics as, and I'm quoting him, dialectics with my difference. Instead of the notion of one, two, three Hegelian, I'm more interested in the movement of water backwards and forwards as a kind of cyclic motion rather than linear. In this understanding of historical process inflected in, in Brathwaite's case by the Middle Passage, events don't pass, but they recede and they, and they return. So this becomes a, a, a model for um, history in, in the Caribbean. I've written about that in my book, um, Archaeopoetics. Um, in a different context, Perez's notion of pro procession in Lucal also dry, draws on um, island and ocean geography to propose a tidalectic mode of historical becoming, where birth, ancestry and geography become intertwined. But Pe Perez's wave-inflected tidalectics entail a much more heightened sense of corporeality and ecological embeddedness than in Brathwaite's vision, a lived bodily sense of detour and return. The title E Tini Tuhon um, of the poem that I was just looking at on the previous slide extends this sense of entangled corporeal environmental becoming by referring to the ancient Chamorro story of Puntan and Fauna, brother and sister creation deities. The story goes that through um, an act of sibling collaboration, they make all material and life on earth out of their bodies and their, um, and their creative energies. Um, so the, the story is kind of quoted here on this slide. In the beginning, Fauna transforms her brother Puntan's back into Tano, land, chest into Langet, sky, eyes into Atado, sun, and Pulan, moon, and then her breath blooms the odor, soil, and Achotasi, 
coral, and then she dives into the place we will name Humatak Bay. Then her body calcifies into the stone from which we were born. So importantly, this tradition understands human and non-human nature as coextensive expressions of common materials and energies. Perez indicates how this belief system has been written over by a long history of colonialism, which separates the human and, and non-human worlds out. Um, but the gestation and birth of his daughter produces an unfolding that tidalectically regenerates this sense of ecological and cultural being. And yet in the context of an environment imbued with various kinds of modern toxicity, uh, many of them derived from uh, military activity in the islands actually, um, the implications of human ecological enmeshment take on new kinds of meaning. This poem um, on, on, that I'm showing you on this slide splices together images of the developing human fetus and plastic ingestion by ocean dwellers, um, non-human or more than human ocean dwellers. Juxtaposing, for example, a reference to C-section with images of the dissection of whales and birds places human and more than human bodies in uncomfortable affinity, like the bellies of whales and birds and the beaches of Oahu and Hawaii, this embryo also becomes a gathering place for the toxic legacies of plastics. As scientific um, research on petrochemical toxicity has indicated, developing fetuses are particularly susceptible to the effects of additives such as phthalates, which make their way into human and uh, non-human bloodstreams through contact with plastics and often ingestion uh, uh, with plastics as well. Um, and although their effects are unknown, uh, that's the scientific consensus at the moment. Uh, there are kind of speculations about the link between these, these chemicals and a wide range of disorders and health threats. Um, the mobility of sub, sub, such substances across geographies, especially oceans and different corporealities, emphasizes what Stacey Alimo has influentially called transcorporeality. As she puts it, and I quote her, transcorporeality, in which the human is always intermeshed with the more than human world, underlines the, underlines the extent to which the substance of the human is ultimately inseparable from the environment. In, in this poem, by poetically yoking together human and non-human bodies, Perez's focus is not only on the substance of the human, but um, on human corporeality as part of a multi-species network of uh, transcorporeal harm. Um, similarly, uh, in, in this poem entitled uh, First Ocean, um, the, this is a poem which interweaves the, the baby daughter's first immersions in water with the rim of the Pacific or RIMPAC military exercises of 2014 hosted by the US Navy in waters around Hawaii where Perez and his family now live. Uh, a lit literary critic Elizabeth de Luffrey has shown how the RIMPAC war games are a highly visual display of US maritime power and aquatic territorialism and actually on some of the covers of some of his his books, um, Perez takes images from, from the RIMPAC exercises, which kind of demonstrate US might at sea um, and, and splice and juxtapose them with other kinds of images. Um, furthermore, Delufry argues that, and I quote her, American militarization of the oceans is foundational to maintaining the global en energy supply that undergirds what some call the Capitalocene. One such proponent of the Capitalocene concept, Jason W. Moore, argues that capitalism is a way of organizing nature. And I quote him, a world ecology joining the accumulation of capital, the pursuit of power and the co-production of nature and dialectical unity. In his argument, capital accumulation is contingent upon the appropriation of what he calls cheap natures, resources, labor and energy via the expansion of commodity frontiers, which enable the unpaid work of human and non-human natures to be channeled into the circuits of capital. And such un unpaid work includes things like childbearing and rearing, soil facility, 
fertility, uh, fossil fuel deposits, ocean currents and winds, and so on. The territorialization of oceans, their various resources, and importantly, cheap transport routes is thus key to ensuring the flow of cheap energy, oil, among other things. The RIMPAC war games are thus interconnected with a wider web of economic appropriation. Perez's poem asks, is Oceania memorial or target, economic zone or monument, territory or makua? These lines indicate how capitalism as a way of organizing nature rewrites traditional indigenous understandings of the sea of islands, transforming Oceania into target, economic zone and territory. Moreover, as Perez's poem documents, the RIMPAC war games which consolidate this appropriation have absolutely devastating ecological implications. I quote from the poem, pilot whales deafened by sonar are bloated and stranded ashore and schools of recently spawned fish, lifeless, spoil the tidelands. To um, quote de Luffrey, the poem calls attention to the ways in which the militarization of Oceania causes a rupture in the responsibilities of the makua, the parent, to the child, a rupture in kuliana, or the chain of responsibility that connects all living beings and matter in Pacific Island indigenous understandings. But as well as sounding a, a note of elegaic uh, lament, it's my sense that this poem also calls for a reinvigoration of that chain of responsibility, precisely by the way that it connects human and other than human beings in these networks of damage. The final lines of this particular poem, um, we shiver like generations of coral reef bleaching invoke the effects of, of, of global heating linked to the bleaching and death of coral. Um, and we saw some, some work around that in the very first presentation today. So that's a kind of nice, <laughs> nice connection. Um, but uh, there's also an assertion of multi-species affinities here. And to, to quote uh, Donna Haraway, who's been mentioned before um, today, which is another lovely strand, um, so Donald Haraway has argued uh, relatively recently, and I quote her, there can be no environmental justice or ecological rewilding without multi-species environmental justice. And that means nurturing and inventing, enduring multi-species kindreds. Kin making requires taking the risk of becoming with new kinds of person making, generative and experimental categories of kindred, other sorts of we, other sorts of selves. So by way of hasty um, conclusion, uh, I want to suggest that the poems that I've shown you today from Lucal perform a kin making of, of this sort um, by poetically splicing, uh, gestating human bodies with non-human victims of plastic ingestion and sound pollution, or by forging affinities between human and coral witnesses to global heating, these poems map networks um, of ecological harm, which are also at the same time, importantly, potential networks of multi-species kin making. Furthermore, this poetry does this by tidalectically reinvigorating indigenous understandings of ecological being. And in so doing, uh, Perez reinvents human and non-human forms of collectivity and solidarity in the context of specific forms of neo-colonial ecological damage and uh, connects them with wider global forces of capitalist and military power. As uh, some of Perez's typography emphasizes, for example, his use of the square brackets, these other sorts of we are as yet incipient, bracketed for the moment. But Perez's poems enact a locale or procession in which they are unfolding sentences. Thank you, Mandy. Um, uh, should we, should, yeah. Um, thank you so much for that um, fascinating talk. And thank you as well for introducing me to um, 
this poet because I and I confess that I hadn't heard of him before I started to prepare but now I've kind of read a number of poems I've heard him talking on YouTube <laughs> reading his poetry and I really urge people to to you know um look at this po uh, poet um it's it's fascinating his combination of the personal the political the ecological and also the emotional um that comes across in in his poetry um and I was just, uh, I want to ask one question before I uh, um, ask, uh, ask others while they're thinking about it. Um, I, was, uh, I was struck by something that he said about poetry itself and that uh, uh, poetry can be a tool for uh, decolonization. Um, it's a process that comes over time through a development and nurturing of both intellectual and sensual acuity. And I wonder if you could Kind of talk about that the role of poetry in in um in fighting for social social justice as well oh that's a big that's a big Sorry. question <laughs> <laughs> yes um well how will i put that um i have a commitment to poetry because of the ways and and, and i know paris uh does too and many other poets of the ways it it it, it, it enables a kind of critique but also circumvention of the ways in which power operates through language um, and uh, I think it's the almost non the non-narrative aspects of, of, of poetry that are, are so good at, at doing that so um, in Craig's own um, uh, long long poetic series he manages to completely, I mean, there are snatches of narrative, but he, he manages to circumvent narrative and weave together these different traditions, these different discourses in ways that never entail him taking, well, it's not that he doesn't take a position, but he puts things together in such ways that he kind of trains us as readers to become kind of critically sharpened to the ways in which language is working um, in, in concert with power. So I would say that that, 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 that is probably at the back of what he means about uh, poetry having this kind of decolonializing power because it takes language apart, it shows us um, you know, how it's working, for example, in that final example, I, he did that kind of binary opposition of, of the indigenous ways of understanding Oceania and the way, and things that has, it has become through colonization and kind of make, that also kind of critiques that, that binary structure of, of self and other. Um, and, and so the, the language enacts, I think in ways that you're probably all really sort of familiar with, that the language enacts through practice, um, a critique of, of those structures, but also slight possibilities for thinking otherwise. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Brilliant. A brilliant answer, I would say. Um, let's I'll just see if uh, anyone has asked a question. Uh, we just have some comments. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Really fascinating talk. Um, uh, to the poetry and watery passion, uh, patterns and shapes, wonderful interweaving of multiple interconnected strands of poetical thinking through the societal and ecological issues we face. Um, puts uh, Linda in mind of Steve McQueen's Carib's Leap Western Deep. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, Tanya says, a wonderful introduction to this extraordinary and important voice. Islands are both isolated and highly significant nodes or strategic points of connection. After your presentation, I can start to think about these poems in this way too. Would you like to say something about that island? Um, yes, I've learned so much about um, the history, the colonial and neo-colonial histories of islands through through engaging with this poet. I, I've worked on um, Caribbean um, poets previously um, and hadn't quite grasped the political significance of, of islands um, in the kind of global power play. So, you know, I, I've, I've gone away and done various forms of research as, as we as we do, um, but one of the things that 
that America has has done, um, other nations as well, but America has done this incredibly successfully, is to have these islands which are unincorporated territories, so they're possessions of the US, but they're not part of the state. Um, and by doing that, and I, that map that I very first showed you kind of indicates this a little bit, if I can find it again. Um, No, I've kind of lost it. Uh, I'll just talk. I'll just talk about it. The um, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea of uh, there was a version of it in the in the fifties, I think, and then in, in the eighties, and it allows nations to extend their economic zones two hundred miles out to sea, so that anything any resources in that area become uh, the property of, of the state. And so by doing that, America has enabled itself to extend, you know, huge swathes of the ocean um, into, into, its, in, into its territory. So it's really interesting how islands are represented as, as remote. And um, I expect, I, I don't know whether you, uh, many of you responded to my question, do you know where, so yeah, I didn't know where Guam was, clueless, only desperately vaguely. Um, you know, so this idea that oceans, are, that islands are kind of off the radar is part of the way in which oceans are kind of hidden from us at the same time as, uh, you know, massive scrambles for the oceans and their resources are, are taking place. So, um, you know, Perez is, is one, he opens up onto all of these other kinds of political knowledge, I think. Um, so yeah, I very much, part of the point of today is to say, go and read him or go and watch his wonderful, um, there's, a, there's a video uh, kind of animation of one of his poems where he reads, um, I can't remember the title, but something to do with the world ocean. Um, but yeah, look, go away and look him up on, online. Yeah, and, I mean, it's an uh, incredibly complex um, history to yeah. Guam. You know, you know, it's been um, colonised by the Spanish and then the Japanese and then uh, the Americans. And, um, and, uh, and I really like the way that um, Craig's poetry, he, although he draws on the myths and cultures of, his, um, of the indigenous peoples, he's very much, a, a, you know, lives in the contemporary world. And he was educated in America, wasn't he, in California? Yeah. Um, so he brings all of these, you know, different layers. And um, it, there's no nostalgic looking back to the past, but he's integrating yeah. these different strands into a into a kind of maybe something for the future, so, some way that we can think differently and live differently. So yeah, really inspiring. No, I think so. He he is he is a really inspiring um, figure. And I also think that uh, this kind of poetry, it's quite difficult to read um, for uh, people who are used to reading poetry that's a kind of expression of the self. But I think that um, anybody who has a kind of uh, artistic practice, particularly if it's not a, a language practice, can probably access this quite, because, you know, we can kind of grasp the idea of its collage poetics and it and its and its non-narrative aspects um, and the way that he kind of splices things together. So although it looks a little bit sort of inaccessible, once you start getting into it, I think it's it it really teaches you a lot. Great. Thank you so much, Mandy. I, we could talk longer on that and maybe we will at, maybe some, we will at some point. I know that some people have to leave and we've come yeah. to the end. It's That's been cool. an incredibly yeah. rich uh, day. Um, uh, so many kind of synchronicities between the speakers, so many amazing papers. So I'd just like to hand over to Kayla. Thank you, Carol, and thank you very much, Mandy. I mean, I left you, I left you a message which you can read, read afterwards in the, oh, okay. in, the in the chat. Um, yeah, so we're just going to wind up and just and bring the symposium to a close now. Um, I'm Dr. Kayla Parker. Um, so with Dr. Carol Baker, we, we, we're we part of the research group with the PhD students who've organised and presented at this um, symposium. Um, and um, our, our idea for the symposium began with Astrid and Imanis's Bodies of Water. Uh, she opens her book with a quotation from Jamie Linton's book, What is Water? The History of a Modern Abstraction. The quote is, water is what we make of it. 
Linton, a geographer, uses a wet ge ge genealogy to describe how the modern abstracted term of water has replaced the once diverse and imaginative plural waters of ideas and language. Rather than a fixed thing, Linton considers water to be a process in action, something becoming and linking to a ver variety of social processes and practices and with a capacity to connect. He says, almost anything can be distilled into a watery met metaphor, but then we can always return to water as a means of dissolving the very things that we have made of it. At the Waterway Symposium this afternoon, we've heard presentations from creative prac practitioners, I'm including you in this, Mandy, about their research, thinking about water, not simply as an abstract thing, but embracing diverse waters, different dimensions and possibilities, thinking, imagining and being through, with and immersed in water. All of us in our research group here today involved in putting on this symposium and contributing to it, share a close connection to waters. We prepare the food we eat with fresh water to nourish our bodies. Our bodies swim in our local rivers and the sea, and some of us kayak on the water. We water the plants that we grow in our gardens and allotments, and so on and so on. Waters are integral to all our lives. We are all bodies of water. And we know that we are privileged to have access to all these waters, as so many are not. And we are aware of water's ecological, political, cultural and philosophical dimensions. And this is a driving force of our research. I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone involved in organising and contributing to Waterways and to everyone who's joined us at the symposium this afternoon for sharing your memories of water and your comments and interactions via the chat. We're particularly grateful to our invited speakers, Tanya Kovats, Professor of Drawing and Making at Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design, University of Dundee, and to Dr. Anya McCausland, the Leverhulme ECR Research Fellow at the Slade School of Fine Art, UCL, for sharing their excellent research and their ideas with us today. And I do hope we can continue to develop our connections with you both and have the opportunity to meet in person one day. Thank you also to our guest speaker from the University of Plymouth, Dr. Mandy Bloomfield, who's Associate Professor in Modern and Contemporary Literature for her, her, her excellent paper on the recent work of the indigenous Chamorro poet, Craig Santos Perez. Thank you to the artist researchers who gave presentations on their doctoral projects, who are in order of appearance, Gail Flockhart, Laurie Reynolds, Linda Ward, Rachel Elaine, Kate Paxman and Mary Pearson. Thanks also to the session chairs, doubling up, Rachel Elaine, Sean Goldstone, Laurie Reynolds and Dr. Carol Baker. A particular thanks to go to Sean Goldstone and Laurie Reynolds for curating and designing the superb online exhibition that complements the symposium and for choosing the Mediterranean gallery setting, which I particularly like. And finally, thank you so much to Mary Pearson who bravely volunteered or foolishly volunteered to take on the role of symposium organiser many months ago. She's worked tirelessly with good humour to bring this whole event together and has been highly professional throughout. And she's kept her sense of humour. She deserves a big round of applause. And uh, Charles is here to say well done, Mary, as well. Charles has come to say hello. Thank you, Charles. And, I'll, and I, I shall now hand you over to Mary for the final word. Okay, I would like to also say that Newman has arrived as well. Oh, so, so uh, he has thoroughly enjoyed the uh -huh. tail end of our presentations as he was uh, snoozling somewhere else. Um, again, I would just like to thank you all for coming. Uh, it has been such a wonderful afternoon and um, I just can't thank you enough for participating. It has been more than I could have ever hoped it could be. And I think all that all of us had hoped it could be. Uh, please have a look at the online exhibition. So beautifully uh, curated. The link for that is a hyperlink. I worked out how to do that, uh, which was in the booklet that was sent out to all of you. Any issues, just let me know. I also put it in, in the chat as well. Um, there are also contact details in the booklet for our speakers if you wish to get in touch with them. Um, 
and I will ensure that an email is sent out to everybody with the link to the recording. As of yet, I am not sure where that is going to be, but as soon as I know, I will make sure that link is sent to you. You will have everything except my introduction because I could not find the record button as I was sharing my screen. So I'm sure that you can live without that. You have the most important bit, so that's all that matters. All right. So thank you ever so much and have a wonderful, wonderful oh. rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Mary. Bye.